Before we get started, I actually want to talk a little bit about what Erlang is. Uh, so does anyone here, has anyone here written Erlang before? Few, okay. So some of this is going to be, some of the topics we discuss should be pretty straightforward to you. For everyone else, it's probably gonna feel like programming 101. Uh, when I was getting into Elixir, trying to like think recursively in a functional language is really like difficult at first and I felt like really stupid. Uh, but once it clicks, um, it will kind of change the way you think about writing programs coming from like an object-oriented background. And uh, we can't talk about Elixir before talking about Erlang. Uh, so Erlang is a language that's been somewhat um, obscure, at least for me. I, I come from a, I have a computer science degree, but I never heard of Erlang or really touched it uh, in college. Um, but really they were kind of like this, they had this nugget of like innovation for like the last 20 years. And uh, they've been largely ignored by the programming community at large, at least object-oriented programming community. And uh, Erlang was uh, developed by a company, uh, Ericsson, to build like telecom, telecommunication systems. And uh, it was, it's really unique because in like 1986 when it was developed, they had like a few set of uh, requirements that even languages today don't really follow. Uh, they needed to build something that was uh, kind of distributed uh, at its heart, so you'd be able to run on like a bunch of telecom switches distributively, uh, something that was highly concurrent, and something that was highly fault tolerant. And uh, even a lot of languages today don't really hit the like trifecta of those three uh, requirements, at least as their focus. Uh, you may say some languages are like fault tolerant because they're stable, um, but, Elixir, or, but Erlang actually has um, mechanisms built in to like restart if something crashes, and they really focus on the fault tolerance. Uh, so if you make a phone call today, for example, there's about a 50% chance it's running through an Erlang system. <laughs> Uh, so Erlang is like tried and true, it's out there, and uh, just to prove it's fault tolerance, uh, you've never had a phone company call you, it's like a joke, uh, your phone company never calls and says, hey, tonight you can't make a phone call from 8 to 10 p.m. because we're going down for scheduled maintenance. Like, you've never heard of that. And uh, we, half of our web services that we use have like downtime and scheduled maintenance. Uh, so Erlang has mechanisms built in to do like hot code uploading, so like literally like zero downtime deploys, where you can upgrade code live in production and go from one state to the next and um, you can run programs distributively that have like no extra fanfare about writing, um, jumping through hoops to run things distributively. You write code against one machine, you can run it on 50, and it all just works. Uh, so let's get started with Elixir. Uh, Elixir is, if you're familiar with Clojure, uh, how Clojure relates to Java, uh, Elixir relates to Erlang. So Elixir compiles to the uh, Erlang virtual machine bytecode, and you can write Elixir, call it from your Erlang code, and we can call Erlang code from our Elixir code. Uh, so Elixir isn't trying to reinvent the wheel, it's trying to build on top of all, all the innovation that Erlang in the Erlang virtual machine has basically brought for the last 20 years. And uh, the reason why I really love Elixir is it brings uh, some pretty awesome features to the table, like uh, metaprogramming. Erlang doesn't really have any great mechanism for like macros or metaprogramming. And as Rubyists, I think all of us are here partially because we love metaprogramming. Uh, so Elixir focuses on that, uh, it adds a, uh, polymorphic layer through protocols. Uh, so we're not writing uh, object-oriented code, but we don't have to throw away polymorphism in Elixir. If you're familiar with Clojure's protocols, that's what Elixir's protocols were inspired by, and we'll touch on what protocols are uh, this afternoon. And uh, Elixir also gives us a focus on like ease of use. Uh, so a lot of us come from Rails. We're at a Rails conference, and Rails is all about being easy to use, um, having really nice features, and Erlang, I think, has a uh, history of being a little bit difficult to get into because they were focusing on uh, more grittier problems uh, historically. Uh, so a lot of the ramp up is much more difficult. So Erlang or Elixir has a focus on uh, ramping up quickly and getting uh, beginners started easily. Uh, so for us to get started, uh, we need to touch on a touch of terminology and then we'll get into some code uh, just so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the term uh, term is used all over the place, and that when we say an, an Elixir term, it basically means an element of any data type in Elixir. And you'll see that in documentation everywhere. Uh, literal is just a value of a term. Uh, when you hear the term binary, it's basically going to be a uh, string of bits, and this comes from Erlang. And uh, when we think of binaries in Elixir, uh, it almost always is used to store like a uh, UTF-8 encoded string. And uh, we'll use a term arity, which you may not be familiar with, and that's the number of arguments a function accepts. Uh, so if you understand those four or five terms, uh, we should be pretty good as far as discussing uh, the rest of the concepts. Uh, one thing you might like is everything is an expression, which uh, after I got into Ruby, I had never been uh, familiar with that, but once I 
basically got onto everything as an expression. If I go to a language that doesn't abide by this, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm not quite getting the power of it. Uh, so here's an if condition in Elixir. Uh, we can store it as a result variable, and it works like you would just expect in Ruby. Uh, it has this uh, do here, which is about the only difference if you were to write this in Ruby. Uh, some people uh, take a look at Elixir and think it's just Ruby syntax on Erlang. Um, don't be fooled by that. Um, it's like a small veneer that might look a little bit like Ruby, but uh, basically the internals uh, semantically are entirely different. And uh, my biggest complaint going between uh, Ruby and Elixir on a daily basis is I write do in my Ruby code or I leave do off in my Elixir code. And it sucks. Other than that, it's, uh, it's pretty nice. Uh, Elixir is an immutable language, uh, so we have to change the way we write programs. We can no longer um, write objects that hide and abstract like mutable state. We have to uh, write our programs in like a, a data transformation uh, way, and that's a very difficult thing to get started with initially, and hopefully we can kind of talk about that uh, today. It follows uh, the actor model of concurrency, if you're familiar with that. Uh, parentheses are optional, just like Ruby, so to call a function, as long as it doesn't introduce ambiguity, it's going to be very similar to what you would do in Ruby, and it has spawned a ton of debates just like in Ruby already. Uh, people hate that parentheses are optional, uh, but I love that they're optional. Uh, documentation is first class. This is one of my favorite things. You write your documentation in Markdown. So you literally uh, document your methods or your functions in Markdown, and then we can have access to them with an IEX. So it's like if you had IRB up and you could just type a function and uh, get the formatted Markdown of that documentation right in like a shell, and it's amazing. And uh, we have coexistence uh, with the Erlang ecosystem, which is huge. So Elixir isn't trying to reinvent everything. Uh, so we can call like, uh, an Elixir function here, uh, we can call IO puts, it's like a Ruby put statement to print the standard out. But if we want to call Erlang, we can call it um, just like if you were like to chain a method off of a symbol in Ruby. So that colon IO is referencing, that means, hey, there's an Erlang module named IO, I'm going to call the fwrite function on it. Uh, so there's inter a complete interoperability between uh, Erlang and Elixir and vice versa. It's a little bit uglier syntax if you're trying to call Elixir from Erlang, you have to prefix it with an Elixir module, um, but calling it from Erlang from Elixir is super straightforward. Like I can call math.py from the Erlang math module and I get pi. So, yeah. Why would you call Elixir from Erlang? If you, so if I release a uh, Elixir library that does something awesome and an Erlang person wants to use it, oh, okay. I guess pretty much for the same reason you would call Erlang from Elixir. There's a library out there that does what you want, and you can drop it in your project and use it. Is there anything that's bigger on the awesome Cool. And uh, before we hop into some uh, the first session here, I want to talk a little bit about why I think Elixir is the future of my programming career. As much as I love Ruby, um, how many people do threading in the Rails apps by show hands? How many people do threading on MRI in the Rails apps? All right, awesome, that one person. Uh, so the concurrency story in Ruby and Rails is really weak. It can be done, uh, but it's kind of like a uh, uh, wild west, and it doesn't work that well. Um, for example, we, we do a lot of like real-time stuff um, when we build uh, Rails applications at work, and we're constantly having to shove stuff into a background job and then like pull the server if we're trying to hit a third-party API because we can't keep a connection open um, in our Rails process because it's going to clog the tubes, basically. So the way we get concurrency in Rails, if we have like a quad core uh, system, we run like four processes of our Rails app. And that's the way we achieve uh, concurrency in Ruby. Getting uh, distracted here. Oops. So as more and more cores get added to CPUs, so there are like 50 core CPUs on the horizon, 100 core CPUs. If 10 years from now we were celebrate Rails' 20th birthday and we have 50 core CPUs that are the norm on my, on my laptop, I don't think we're going to all be standing up here saying, well, we just run 50 Rails processes to achieve concurrency. So I think that's a problem. And uh, I think it's inherent to Ruby's architecture. Um, some people get by perfectly like that. That's how we deploy all of our Rails apps and it works really well. But it starts to fall down if you're trying to do anything highly concurrent. If you're trying to, trying to do something uh, like parallelize some work, it's almost impossible. 
Like we jump through all these hoops, uh, running like sidekick or rescue workers to try to like coordinate them together to do some work together. And that's because uh, we cannot properly do concurrency in Ruby in the ways we want to do it. Uh, so getting into Elixir, uh, concurrency is basically the heart of everything we do. And it gets rid of threading, because uh, you can say, well, we'll just add really proper threading in Ruby, or we'll use JRuby, get proper threading. Uh, that still isn't the best way to achieve concurrency, because you have to deal with like mutexes and locks, you have shared mutable state, it's really difficult to reason about, and it's really difficult to write programs around. Uh, so writing in a functional way with a mutable state lets us write programs uh, that are safe and concurrent, and it's really simple to reason about. And we'll see how message passing works later. Uh, and we, we use processes that aren't operating system processes, but we can run like a million of them on our machines. So I can spin up a million uh, Elixir processes, and you couldn't spin up a million threads on any operating system that I'm aware of. And uh, if anyone's familiar with like WhatsApp, I got of $20 billion fame recently, uh, they're running, they're an Erlang app, and they're running a million concurrent connections per server. To give you an idea of uh, the language envy that I have coming from Ruby, where like, you know, we have like Action Controller live in Rails, but if you go over like 15 concurrent requests, you like destroy your database pool of connections, and um, all these things give me um, pause to think about where we need to move as a Rails community to handle concurrency properly. Uh, so who here is, is still working on getting set up? Okay. So uh, by show of hands, uh, who has Erlang at least built and installed? That's still working on getting set up. So you're still building Erlang? No, it's not set up. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna get started. Um, Try to pair with someone if they're working next to you. Um, we're just, this is pretty basic starting out, uh, but hopefully that by the time you get into some real code examples, you'll be able to type it in and be good to go. All right, so uh, Elixir has just a very small set of types. We have integer float atom. Uh, when you hear atom, you should think symbol in Ruby. It's almost synonymous uh, with symbols. We call them atoms in Elixir. Uh, we have a tuple. A tuple is uh, something that holds, uh, it's stored contiguous in, contiguously in memory. You can think of it almost like an array. Uh, it's allocated uh, contiguously in memory. And uh, tuple comes from something that stores like multiple items, like quintuple, multiple. So it sounds a little odd, but that's what tuple comes from. Uh, list is a linked list. And uh, we went through a bit string before, it's just a string of bits. And a PID is a like process ID. So something, you can almost think of them like threads, but they're very lightweight, and it's like Elixir's unit of concurrency. We can run like a million of them. And from these uh, small set of types, we pretty much do all of our programming. Um, there's some, a few other uh, layers that Elixir builds on top, but uh, we basically, instead of writing objects that like hide state, we write, uh, functions to mutate some data structures. So it's basically like data in, data out from a very small set of types. And you end up constructing your programs around all of these types. Uh, so atoms are pretty self-explanatory, uh, just like Ruby. You open up IEX, we can just say atom, it's an atom. There's some built-in functions to type check. So I can say is atom, atom, and it's true. Just like Ruby, uh, and in, just like Ruby, and if you have user provide an input and you want to call uh, to Adam on it, you can fill up the Adam table. There's only a set amount of atoms. It's a massive number, but it's just like in Ruby. If you ever call to sim on user provide an input, you're potentially at risk for memory over overflow because Ruby doesn't garbage collect the symbol table. Same thing applies to our Elixir. So be careful when trying to take user input as an atom or as a string and then cast it as an atom. Is there um, like a I know in Elixir when you control C, there's all these options like yep. respect to what's going on. Can you like from there? Can you like clear the atom table or something? Like if you um, I'm not table? sure. I don't know that there's a command to do it. There might be. Okay. Um, you, you can pass um, runtime options when you run IEX. <coughs> that would make the um, number maximum number of atoms larger if for some reason you required it. Okay. Uh, so I've never like run into it in a real world use case where I filled up the table. Gotcha. Um, but. Same rules apply within Ruby, just don't cast user input to an atom unless you know what's going on. He's about to start garbage collecting guys, Saw that, yeah, that's actually awesome. Right. 
And then uh, tuples are stored contiguously in memory. Uh, we define them between brackets. And uh, tuples can hold uh, any term. So any type we can uh, store as a tuple. So I can put a string inside, say one, two, three, and that's a valid tuple. They can hold uh, anything we want to shove in them that's built into Elixir. And uh, you would use tuples when you have a uh, fixed set of data. So tuples don't really lend themselves well to be appended to. So if you had something like a three element tuple that you know is always three elements, you use a tuple, it's very efficient, very fast, because it's stored continuously in memory. And uh, they're kind of like the most basic data structure uh, in Elixir and Erlang. So you would use them um, as like return types, uh, especially once we get into pattern matching, tuples are used all over the place. Uh, they're kind of like, uh, passed around and used as a way to like decorate data. And we'll see that in a moment. Uh, lists are linked lists. And lists are, um, basically are used everywhere to store any kind of collection. And uh, again, they're very basic, uh, but we build up our programs around some very basic data structures. Uh, so <coughs> we can create a list. One, two, three, four, it works. And uh, we use like a head tail uh, denotation. If anyone's familiar with uh, other functional languages, uh, they use this uh, HT notation for like a head of a list and a tail of a list. And this is the way that we basically perform like recursive iteration internally. And here's our first little bit of pattern matching, which is gives me language envy uh, every time I go back to Ruby. So I can say, okay, I have some head. I use like that pipe character and say I have some tail of a list. And I want to e store that as some, or pattern match it against some list, right? <clears throat> so it's almost like destruction or assignment, if you've ever heard of that term. And if I check the variable head, I see that it's one, and then tail is the remainder of that list. And uh, this is highly, highly optimized by the virtual machine. And uh, this is our first taste of pattern matching, which we'll get into some advanced examples. Uh, so the Erlang virtual machine basically is like a pattern matching genius. It lives to pattern match. And pattern matching, basically, it takes a thing on the left-hand side and tries to match it against a thing on the right. And you can basically uh, use any term, any data type in Elixir and pattern match uh, on its values. Is there head and tail special words there, or is it just something pipe yep. something? It's just something pipe something. That's actually a good question. I was, I was worried people might think that when I said the HT. Yeah, so we can cast any variable there. <clears throat> and this uh, goes beyond that, so I can say, Okay, the first element of my list, I expect it to be one. Uh, second element should be two. The third is a variable. And then the rest is gonna be the tail of the list. And that's totally valid. Uh, so third is now three. Rest is gonna be the remainder of the list. And uh, this works for any data structure. So this is just a list. Uh, we could have a tuple on the left-hand side and it would work. Once we get into maps and structs later, uh, it works even at a more uh, higher level, which is super nice, and it will blow up if it can't do a match. So let's add, uh, that's not gonna work. Let's say our first element is not, is not one. It's gonna blow up, it's really angry, there's a match error, and uh, this is a Erlang, uh, you can read that in red. Uh, match error is like a nemesis for a lot of uh, people getting into Erlang, especially, because uh, their programs will just blow up, um, and the error will be match error, no stack trace. Uh, so Elixir is trying to um, get much better error messaging handling than Erlang, um, but you see match error a lot of times because that's the fundamental way to, uh, I gotta be careful how I say this. So we wanna make our programs crash instead of rescue from exceptions, which we'll get into later. Uh, so it, ideally, if something doesn't match when we expect it to, we literally want our programs to crash from a match error, and that will be supervised by another process and restarted, or we can handle it in some other way. Uh, so our, we write our programs around pattern matching, and if something doesn't match a pattern that we expect, it blows up with a match error uh, by design. And we'll see how that works. And we, so we don't end up with like in Ruby where you like begin, rescue, rescue from this error, rescue from this error. We very rarely uh, rescue from errors in Elixir because by design, um, an error is an exceptional state, and we have no idea why it happens, so trying to rescue from it from the Erlang and Elixir philosophy uh, isn't the right thing to do. And we'll see that uh, this afternoon once we get into OTP. Uh, there's some helper methods like HD will give you the head of the list, TL will give you the tail. You don't want to use the head tail pattern match example. You can just call it directly with the HD and TL method. 
And uh, Elixir has a built -in, uh, some built-in modules to help us work with lists in any kind of uh, collection. Uh, so enum is a built-in module in Elixir that handles uh, a polymorphic um, concept of a collection. So we can iterate over a list, we can iterate over uh, a map and some other uh, built-in data types. And you can write a uh, protocol, as we get into this afternoon, that you can pass to enum, and this is where the polymorphism comes in, where I could write, uh, this afternoon we'll have like the uh, concept of a tweet, and uh, we'll be able to iterate over its messages by defining a enum protocol for it. And uh, if you have IEX up, I want you to play with the h helper function, because it's awesome. I miss it in Ruby. So h is a built-in helper function where I can say, you know what? Um, you know, tab completes your friend too. So I'm gonna type enum, hit tab, I get a bunch of options. But if I wanna know what enum at is, I can just say h enum at, and there's that formatted um, documentation because it was documented in Markdown. So Elixir, when it compiles, it stores all of the, mark all the Markdown documentation as metadata. You can get access to that. And it's nicely color coded. So constantly, I do like, you know, I, I always say I do IRB driven development. Um, during my Rails apps. Uh, so I use a lot of IEX driven development. Uh, it works the same way, because I can come in, I can even get up my own code documentation like this. So if I wrote my own module and I documented it, I can say H, give it the module and function name, and bam, I have documentation for it, formatted directly from Markdown. And then you get some nice examples for it. Um, so for me, this is a huge, huge feature, and especially as you're learning, um, just like get in and explore. So if I say H, uh, can I do HH? Because I'm like meta. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> HH works. So pretty cool. Um, so use H as your friend. Uh, and then uh, Ena Matt will give you some niceties. So we're going to go through some recursive examples with lists later just to, give you, to get you thinking recursively. And then you'll probably never have to do that ever again because you'll use the Ena module to do some list operations instead of writing it uh, in your own recursive style. And a big type in Elixir is keyword lists. And this is basically syntactic sugar over lists. Uh, and they're almost synonymous with like a hash in Ruby. Uh, but they're not hashes. They're just stored as uh, lists when it's compiled. Uh, so it's, it's not meant for like true uh, constant uh, lookup time like hashes are. So it's for like small sets of keys and values. But they're uh, very cheap and very uh, easy to use. And Elixir internally, when it compiles your source code in its uh, abstract syntax tree, uh, it's using keyword lists um, to do some um, really neat things, which we'll, we'll see later. Uh, so a keyword list is defined uh, pretty similarly to a hash in Ruby. So we define it between brackets because really it's just a list. So I can say the types in Elixir <coughs> store as some variable and say when well, atom, it's called an atom. So it's just the key value as you would expect. And we'll say we have a uh, what are some other types? Tuple. So there's our keyword list. And then I can access them like a hash in uh, Ruby. Give it a key. There's our value. I give it a key that doesn't exist. It gives me nil, like Ruby. And uh, the neat thing about what Elixir is doing with this internally, I'll show you this is just syntactic sugar. I can say, OK. A keyword list internally is stored as just a list of two element tuples. The first element is the key, the second element is the value. So I can say I have a list, it's going to take a tuple, is that equal to the keyword list? Oops, missed the quote. So you'll find yourself, you, if you control C out twice, it's going to quit IEX and then you lose your history. Uh, so you can actually type uh, IEX break if you find yourself in this scenario. There we go. And I messed that up too. And I'm just going to quit. Really? Oh, there we go. Okay. So literally the thing on the left-hand side is equal to the thing on the right. Elixir just provides us some syntactic sugar on top of lists to do a nice set of uh, key value pairs. And we saw before in that first example, you might remember we had an if statement. So I say if true, I can give it a do in block. So I can say if true, do, it's true. You find out, oh my gosh, it's true. Uh, so everything between the do and the end in Elixir is just literally syntactic sugar 
for uh, if is a macro, which we'll get into later. So if you're calling if, uh, first element is an expression, and then the second element between a do and end, Elixir, convert, Elixir converts that to literally a keyword list as a second argument. And you can leave off the uh, list uh, brackets. If it's the last argument, like Ruby, you can leave off the hash uh, bracket or hash braces, uh, similar concept. So this is synonymous with And so that works. Uh, so everything in Elixir is built up literally as like a uh, do in block as a single uh, key keyword list. The key is do and the value is the block of code. And when we get into writing macros, this becomes uh, super handy because we, we can inspect that and get like the AST directly of uh, the code that we want. Uh, there's a keyword module that provides some niceties so I can ask, like, uh, give me the keys of uh, some keyword list that I have, and it's going to spit out the keys. Uh, so Elixir has a small standard library, but um, it provides you most of the building blocks that you need to write um, most of your programs. So it's not as extensive as in, in Ruby, especially uh, we're all familiar with like active support, which like you forget like what's Ruby and what's active support. Uh, so you're not going to have quite the like you know array dot 47 to get the 47th element or the array dot third. Um, but you, the standard library actually is quite nice, so um, it's really well thought out. And uh, I don't think I mentioned before, uh, who's aware of who Jose Valim is? Hopefully most people. He wrote Elixir, I meant to plug him initially. Um, he's prolific in the Rails community. He was uh, part of Rails Core. He wrote Devise. He wrote Simple Form. He wrote probably, uh, or he had a hand in probably half of the uh, gyms that you use on a daily basis. So he put Elixir together, and um, he's made uh, some really excellent choices. And it shows, in my opinion, in the standard library and in the metaprogramming around Elixir in pretty much all areas. What's the magic uh, break incantation? Uh, IEX uh, and then pound break should get you out. Let me find out, actually. I always forget. So now I'm in like a bad state where it thinks I'm continuing an expression. I should be able to hit Control-C once. I think it might be actually this. No, eh? <laughs> So, I actually think that's, uh, so Elixir's IEX is built on top of the Erlang uh, URL shell. I'm pretty sure that's Erlang because we like a little better error messages than eh, but that's all right. Really? I have to look this up. You're saying... That's. So you're saying I you did, did what? You did a control C here. No, no, the hash Oh, I see what you're saying. That's what you, yeah. It's like yeah. hash I have to look this up. <laughs> Basically, um, history is not in place yet. So if you quit out of your shell, um, it's really frustrating because like in Ruby, I'll constantly you know, hit quit, relaunch a shell, and I'll have my history. And uh, Elixir, we don't get that yet. And that's built on part because there's some, it's built on top of the Erlang shell, and there's some issues with trying to get history in place. I know that there are some pending pull requests, but um, I'm not aware of why, they, why we haven't quite gotten there yet. So you do a lot of copy pasting if you ever quit out of IEX. Uh, variables are immutable. Um, but what a lot, some people hate that uh, do Erlang is that we can rebind variables to a new value. Some people call this mutability, but they would be wrong, in my opinion. So if I define a uh, variable uh, named sum, uh, instead of saying define variables, uh, the term that we use is we bind variables to a value. So I can say uh, sum is 10. Now I have bind a thing named sum to the value 10. Uh, if you're coming from Erlang, you would never, ever in this scope be able to um, rebind sum to a new value. It would blow up with a, an error because it, Erlang is like single assignment principle, if you've heard of that. Um, but in Elixir, we can say, okay, now sum is 12. And some people would say, ah, this is a mutable language. You've just changed sum's value. Elixir's terrible. A lot of people on Twitter um, that are coming from Erlang have, have hated on this uh, concept. Um, but all we've done here is Elixir still abides by the single uh, assignment principle, but 
Uh, internally, when this is compiled, it's saying, OK, we're going to take the thing that was named sum, and we're just going to rebind it to a new value. Anyone that had a reference to sum prior to this, sum would still be 10. Uh, so we didn't actually mutate that variable, if that makes any sense. Is everyone clear on that? I think I can show that with an anonymous function. If I said, uh, we can create an anonymous function. We can see for the first time, we'll say some value. That actually, that could actually work too. But then at the moment we added it, it would actually be, the value would be stored there, not the reference to the variable. Um, so I can say, I would uh, put uh, some was, so this is an anonymous function. We define it with fn dash rocket, and then we give an end. And uh, just like like JavaScript and some other functional languages, uh, functions uh, close over variables. So it's going to close over the sum that was 12. So now I have uh, sum val as an anonymous function. And if I want to, I'm going to change sum again. So okay, sum is now 100. So if I invoke that anonymous function, we see sum was 12. So we haven't mutated. Some when we said sum equals 100, we just rebound that to a new value. Uh, so this trips some people up coming from Erlang because they're so used to uh, defining, like if they, if they ever come into a case where they want to uh, change something, uh, you'll see like sum one, sum two, sum three in code a lot. And this gets around that. Um, and we can see that we can invoke anonymous functions uh, with the dot notation, which seems a little bit odd. And uh, some people really don't like this. Uh, but as you get further into this, um, I actually really like this. So anonymous functions are invoked with, it's called like dot notation or the dot operator. And the reason why we have this is because if we didn't have, if we want to invoke it, some people want this to be changed uh, to this. Coming from like a JavaScript background, a lot of functional languages, uh, this would ruin uh, zero function arity in Elixir. So if we ever wanted to call a function off of a module in Elixir, as I'll get into later, that didn't have, that didn't take any arguments, we would have to include the braces. Like here's one example. Self will give you the current process ID, and that's a building off the kernel. Um, if we didn't have uh, the dot notation on anonymous functions, uh, we would no longer call self. We'd have to call self like this, which still works. <coughs> so the dot notation resolves that ambiguity on do we want to call a function or do we want to reference to self? Is everyone clear on that? Because like self, you know, like JavaScript, for example, if we had a function, self would return us a reference to that function. But in Elixir, zero arity is actually just going to invoke it. So for anonymous functions, we use the dot operator uh, to actually explicitly invoke that function. Otherwise, we just have a reference to it. And then pattern matching, we saw a little bit before, is actually doing variable binding. So first rest equals Alice, Bob, Ted list. Uh, first and rest are going to be bound to the head and the tail of the list. So we're actually doing a variable binding within pattern matching. As we saw earlier, just went through a rebinding example. Uh, so functions in, Elix in Elixir are first class, like you would expect in a functional language. We can define them uh, and pass them around, uh, just like any good functional language does. Um, let's see if this is worth actually going through. Yeah, might as well do it. So we can define an anonymous function named add. Again, we use fn notation, and the arguments are passed in. So add's going to take first number and a second number. All it's going to do is add them together, return the result. Pretty easy. And just like in uh, Ruby, everything is an expression again, so there's no return. There's actually, Ruby has a return keyword. Elixir has no concept of return. So the last thing evaluated is the thing returned. So we don't return in Elixir. We just write expressions. So I can say, OK, we have some subtract as well. And that's going to subtract the numbers. So if I wanted to like perform some calculation, I could say, OK, I'm going to perform a calculation. It takes a first number, a second number, and then a function as a third argument to invoke, just to show you that we can pass these things around. I like to, you can hit enter and it will continue that expression so you don't have to like write it on one line. So we can say, okay, we want to explicitly invoke that function you passed to me with the dot operator and we'll just pass in the first number and the second number. And there's our perform calc function. 
So then we can see that functions are first class by saying, okay, I want to perform a calculation, say five and six, and I want to pass that add function that I defined above. And it works. Uh, so functions are first class. Um, anonymous functions are actually used a lot less as, as far as passing them around and defining them explicitly like this. Uh, we use anonymous functions um, as part of like enum modules and performing mapping operations, but most of our code is going to live in modules that we'll get into um, very shortly. So you're not going to be using the dot notation quite as often as you would think. Uh, so if you hate it, um, it really isn't used all that often compared to calling functions on modules which do not use the dot notation. And uh, Elixir has a shorthand function syntax for uh, some cases where like writing the fn uh, arguments is a little bit verbose. Uh, so for example, I have a enum map operation. So mapping over a set, just like Ruby's uh, uh, array uh, collector array map, we can map over a list, multiply uh, the first, or multiply each element by two. And we see if we get the correct result. So this ampersand syntax is basically uh, synonymous with saying, okay, I have some number and I want to multiply it uh, by two. So these two uh, top and bottom are synonymous. So we use uh, ampersand to like create a shorthand function syntax. And then ampersand one is going to say, okay, the first argument to this function, do something with it. Uh, so this is nice and succinct for very, very simple operations, uh, but I caution everyone, do not litter your code with the shorthand function syntax uh, unless it's a very trivial transformation uh, because it's one of these things that uh, I, tend, I try to uh, say uh, always be, uh, have clarity over brevity. So if you get into like ampersand one, ampersand two, and you're doing some transformation on that data, someone reading through your code later or your own self reading through your code later is going to have no idea what's going on. Uh, so it's nice to use if we're just doing a simple operation. Otherwise, use the expanded syntax is the rule that I try, try to abide by. And uh, you often hear uh, people call the ampersand and then a function uh, the capture operator. I've heard it called. So we can like capture functions. Uh, so some people uh, say, well, we, if I have an, a reference to an anonymous function uh, that I have to invoke, but on uh, modules, I don't use the dot operator. So if I want to do like kernel... If I say like five plus two, really what that's doing is calling the uh, off the kernel's uh, imported plus function. So literally uh, five, or five plus two uh, is actually doing this internally. If I want to capture kernel plus as an anonymous function, I, use, I prefix it with an ampersand. So if I want to say, okay, uh, add is actually going to be a captured uh, function off of this module. I have to do this, so capture it by name and also arity. So all functions in uh, Elixir and Erlang are defined by their name plus their arity. So I have to give it slash two here. And now I have captured Erlang's and Elixir's uh, plus operator. And I had to specify the arity because uh, there are no, uh, uh, all of your functions cannot have like any arbitrary number of uh, arguments. And uh, from Ruby, I think half, the, especially from Rails, half the time you can pass in a list, half the time you can pass in like a splat. Uh, you kind of have to ditch that idea uh, coming into Elixir because we are fixed by name plus arity. Um, but what we lose in being able to pass like splat arguments, we gain in using pattern matching and writing our code around pattern matching. And we'll see once we define modules how well that works out. Uh, so you can stop thinking about functions as just having a name. You, can, you have to start thinking about functions having a signature of name plus arity plus guard statements, as we'll get into later. So two functions can have the same name and different Yes. And you'll exploit that um, to great benefit, as we'll see later. We could define a function. We can almost, you can almost think of it as like overloading a function, but really each function has its own unique signature, and the virtual machine will use pattern matching to figure out which one to invoke. And then here's just a... Simple example using the capture operator. Uh, and this is this one's a little more explicit. Ooh, that's, let's store this as a new variable first. So if I have some list, then I want to filter over that list. So enum 
use tab complete to explore the enum module with the h helper with a bunch of built-in functions. So I want to filter a list, and then filter is going to say, give me a function, um, and the, if the function returns true, it's going to give you a bad error. error. <laughs> Uh, let's see, what did it get mad about? Oh, it's going to pass the element in. Um, so if the element was truthy, it's going to give you everything back. Uh, so if you just passed in the element, everything's true in Elixir, just like root. The only thing that's false in Elixir is nil and false. Um, but we can say uh, in Erlang, we have a built in uh, is number function. So I can call it is number on that element. And it's going to fill through that list, and I only get one and two back. Um, but it, since that's such a trivial operation, I can use the capture operator. And uh, instead, say ampersand, and I don't have to use um, parentheses if I don't want to here. I can say capture that is number and pass in the item. And mad. Oh, misspelled. So anytime I use the shorthand function syntax, it will almost always be cases like this, where it's trivial and I have like a single. Um, argument to the function. So if you ever find yourself like ampersand one, ampersand two, ampersand three, that would work if your anonymous function took three arguments. Um, but for me, then your code starts getting spaghetti-like to me. So be a little bit careful with that. I have a warning, use sparingly. Oops. So we went over captured functions. And then we can pass captured functions directly as like a second argument. So like reduce and map always take a argument as a last operation to perform some transformation. So if I want to add or reduce one, two, three, just like reduce in Ruby, I can pass in kernel plus captured area two. And it's going to add them together. So you use capturing quite a bit if you ever want a reference to a function to invoke later. Here's where we get into modules, which we'll write a little bit of. Uh, so modules in Elixir are going to live, most of the code you write are going to be in modules. So you're very rarely going to be defining your own anonymous functions to perform some work. We'll pass anonymous functions to some modules as arguments, but very rarely will we be defining like add. Usually we'll define a module and then define, this is referred to as a named function. So like Celsius to Fahrenheit in this example is going to be a named function, not to be confused with anonymous functions. And uh, we can see uh, we have like def module. To, it's the way that we define modules. We give it a name, which is camel cased. And uh, we, then we give it some code between do and an end. And just like on that if statement, if you wanted to write a macro around this or get at the internal representation, that do all the way between do and end here. So all of this really is syntactic sugar for a keyword list of do and the value of all that code. Um, so once we get into macros, I'll touch on a little bit this afternoon. It's a little bit advanced. Um, but we can get at that um, representation of code very easily. So everything in Elixir is built up from some very uh, simple building blocks. And it carries out throughout the language. So you have like if, do, end, def module, do, end. Uh, it's very uh, similar all across most of its uh, building blocks of the code that you write. Uh, so we can just copy and paste this directly into IEX and play with it. So you see that it said, OK, give me a tuple back, um, the name of the module, weather, and then like all of this crazy stuff, right? Uh, so that's actually the bytecode. So it compiled this. Elixir is a compiled language. So you're literally looking at the, like, the bytecode of that weather module, if you're, if you're curious. Uh, and then we can call it. So if I want to say, give me Celsius to Fahrenheit, tab complete is your friend. So if it's 31, or wait, Celsius to Fahrenheit. There we go, 32. So uh, we invoke, this is very similar to Ruby. We invoke named functions without the dot notation. And this is how you would write most of your code. You would write it on modules and invoke the functions uh, very similar to like a class method in Ruby. So this should look pretty familiar. And then parentheses are optional as well. So if I wanted to invoke it like this, clear the scroll back, that'd be totally valid. I get 32. Uh, but we define functions with def. So if you're coming from like a uh, closure uses def, like lot of lists use def, um, that's how we define name functions. So we say def uh, the function name and then arguments. And then do end again is syntactic sugar for a second argument of a keyword list. Uh, so we have two ways, if you, if you ever have a uh, single 
line to like you can perform a tiny bit of work in. Uh, you can literally just write it like this, and this is actually the preferred style if you have a very succinct function. So if your function fits on a small line and it's doing uh, something very simple, say def high comma do and then give it a value. And again, this is just uh, syntactic sugar up here uh, for the do end. So if you ever have a multi-line function, you're going to want to use the do end. But if you have a very short function that's a single line, you can throw it in the uh, single line syntax here. Uh, so constants will, let me see if I ha actually, I think I do this in the next section. We have a similar mechanism to constants. Let's go back. We'll get to it okay. a little bit later. Uh, the constants are actually, we refer to them as like module attributes, which are kind of synonymous, uh, but we don't, we're not quite there yet. Uh, so let's hop into pattern matching a little bit. We've seen some examples of pattern matching, uh, but just to show you a little bit extra of what's going on, uh, if we want to pattern match on like a variable's value, uh, this trips people up sometimes. So if I bind A to one, and I want to actually pattern match on A's value this and not rebind it. So if I want to say A is one and uh, B is one, if I want to say does A match B, we say like, well, we have an equal sign, it's gonna match the thing on the left or the right. If I did this, it would actually rebind A. But if I wanted to pattern match on the value, I'd use the like hat operator, what's referred to, and it's gonna match on it. People from Erlang really don't like this because they like single assignment. So if you accidentally left off the hat operator, you would end up blowing away A and rebinding it to a value. So now we should be able to write our first program in a text editor. Uh, actually, we'll go into control, control flow first. Uh, so we saw if before, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we have if else, and we have unless, which is awesome, but there is no unless else. By design. So if you have unless else in Ruby and you write it a lot, you should probably stop. <laughs> um, so we have a con keyword. Uh, so if you ever find yourself like doing if else, if else, if else in Ruby, uh, Elixir can't do that. You literally get one if and you get one else. There's no else if. Uh, so what you would use instead is cond, and cond takes a uh, series of Boolean expressions and it's going to evaluate the first tricky clause. So if I define a variable named temperature, I can say cond and then just start some clauses. And the first one that's truthy, it's going to evaluate and return the result. So we see that it was freezing. Um, I don't think I've actually ever used cond in any code for real uh, because I'll use case instead. Uh, but cond is there um, and it's pretty handy. Um, but most of your uh, control flow is actually going to use case. And um, you're going to use very little if statements in Elixir. Very uh, much fewer ifs than you would think because we use pattern matching instead to do a lot of our control flow. Uh, and that's where case comes in. So case is control flow based on pattern matching. So we can give uh, case an expression and then we can give it a bunch of clauses instead of, instead of to evaluate as like truthy, it's gonna actually pattern match on the thing on the left. And the first thing that actually matches, it's gonna call the calls on the right. Uh, so for this example here, we can again just copy and paste this into IEX. If I wanted to make like a very simple parser, quote unquote, in Elixir that's going to operate and do some expressions. I can store that anonymous function that calls case on some <coughs> tuple expression, and I can pattern match on the operator and some values provided. And it's going to, case is gonna go from top to bottom on each of these patterns, and if it finds a match, it's gonna evaluate the thing on the right hand side. So I can say, okay, let's invoke calculates, pass it a tuple expression. Let's say if we have, if we have parsed some user input and then we probably cast it to a plus atom, which we shouldn't have done that I mentioned before. Let's pretend that I use a string for this example. So let's say we parse some user input from a calculator and we know that we have the operator plus and we have a couple values. We can call case on that expression, which is a three element tuple. First element's the operator and it's going to literally go from top to bottom here and try each of these clauses out, pattern matching on each thing. First one that matches, it invokes the thing on the right hand side. 
we give it something that doesn't match any of our clauses, like a four element tuple, it's gonna blow up with the case clause error. So you have to define something that matches always. Uh, so a lot of times you'll end up with like an underscore dash rocket, which just says, I don't care what it is, uh, but I want something to match. And you can do neat things like uh, short circuit. So pattern matching isn't just like pattern matching and binding to variables. This is a trivial example, but let's say if I had some expensive operation and I, if someone passed in a zero, I know that this is just gonna be zero. I don't wanna perform any operation. So just get, to give you an idea of pattern matching, it's not just like binding uh, variables. We can say, if you give me a multiplication uh, number and then a zero, I'm gonna do a short circuit and say, well, I know that's zero. I mean, this is kind of stupid, but gives you an idea that we can pattern match on a provided variable, say num1 in this example right here uh, can be anything, whatever it is. If the second thing is zero that you passed in, it's gonna match the clause and give us uh, zero back. Uh, so you use case uh, pretty constantly. Uh, if you find yourself doing a bunch of if-elses, it kind of almost, I'd say 80% of the time, um, be done better with pattern matching. When, uh, in this example, if you had the other multiply, um, num1, num2, if you had that before the zero, would the zero would never? Yes, that's time. a very good point. So once we get into modules, almost all, this rule almost always applies. It's going to pattern match from top to bottom. So if we defined, uh, he's saying that if we defined uh, this clause with the multiplication above uh, the num1 and zero, we would never invoke that num1, zero clause, so even if you not, pass zero in. So it doesn't like look through the potential matches for like Correct, more it goes activity. top to bottom, the first one that matches, it's gonna invoke. And that's actually really important once we get into pattern matching on function names, because if you were like writing a recursive operation where at the end you wanted it to stop, mm -hmm. but you define it afterwards, you would have like an infinite loop. And, but we'll go through that, yeah. What's the arity of that calculated function? So arity here, this would be a single arity function because we're passing it a tuple. Okay, so you don't have to define that in when you actually define the function itself? So like function here takes a single argument expression. Oh, that is, okay. Yeah. yeah I, I and then here we're just passing in a tuple. So a lot of times people get around arities by uh, passing in like a list and the list can take any number of arguments but it's a little bit more verbose. If you had a local variable bound to zero, would you use that local variable's name in place of zero? Would it uh, be equivalent to Right here? Yeah. Uh, if we use the hat operator. So uh, we can actually see that. So if I uh, here, if I just said like var zero there or something, um, it would just, if it, in, if something matched that clause, it would invoke this thing on the right, but var zero would be bound to whatever value they passed in. But how we defined uh, var zero outside of this scope, like up here, and then we use that uh, hat operator, var zero, it would perform a match instead of a binding. That makes sense. So anytime in your case statements, you'll want to, if you ever want to match on a variable's value, you use that hat uh, notation. That makes sense? And then here's like the um, issue if I don't want a case clause error. If you give me something that I can't match against, uh, it's gonna blow up and say like, whoa, I wasn't able to match anything, crash. So uh, a lot of times we'll just use like the underscore to say, I don't care what it is, and then it's gonna invoke this clause. If, if you get something that it can't parse, we can say, you know, raise an error, unable to parse the expression. Uh, so this like underscore notation is used quite often as like a catch-all clause. And that will always be last, because if we had this first at the top, it would always raise unable to parse. Yeah? So could you use that underscore in your like match cases, and then do like your symbol plus comma underscore, and then make that a function to just be everything else it catches with pluses in between it somehow? Yes, so you're saying if we had like uh, some expression, maybe it took a plus, and then if we passed it like seven, and then like whatever else, um, you know, sevens aren't allowed. I'm really bad at examples, so. Your client gave you these requirements, as they normally do, you know, and uh, otherwise, I don't know. Who can return? It would have to be a number one seven, right? Here. Wait, so what, so what are we trying to do then? <laughs> oh, well, in this example, it would, if you did seven and then anything, and then you did seven. Oh, then yeah, then you're nine. totally right, so let's just do yeah, that, it would have never matched. It would have, uh, the compiler would have taken it, but it would have, it would have been pointless, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, this is, so this is totally valid. 
if I call calculate Seven aren't allowed. So you'll actually you'll see that under bar, and it, and it works in any match anywhere, and that's for cases where we can discard a variable. And I'll use I use this constantly in my code where if I'm going, especially when you're writing macros, if you have some like three element list, and your API for some reason is always a three element list, and the last thing is some like expression that you want, uh, you'll very often uh, see like uh, it's called like discarding that. Like we don't want to bind that to a variable. In the compiler, if we ever if we did that bind that to a variable and then didn't use that variable, we get a warning in our code. Uh, it would work, but then we all hate warnings. I get them constantly in my Rails app for like some XML library. So uh, you know, rake routes spits out a compiler or a runtime warning that sticks me off. Yeah. So like in your thing, you bind to n1, n2, and then you use n1 plus n2 or whatever. Can you use underscore? Can you bind to underscore and then say n1 plus underscore, or is it it's like actually disarming? Uh, you, you actually could use n1 plus underscore. Okay. You probably wouldn't want to. It's just um, a convention of saying I don't care about it's this. A it's a convention for saying I don't care about this, and it's a way to stop the compiler. The compiler, the compiler will never complain about underscore. Like, okay. you didn't use underscore, you won't get a warning for that. You could use it. Um, if you find yourself doing that, I wouldn't do it. Um, but initially, I thought that it did literally discard it. Um, but then in, in your code, you actually can use it. Um, if you wanted to be, is that, it's actually, that's a good question. Yeah, but it's, if I wanted to say, it. what's it that? Discards it. Yeah, but if I wanted to say I have some first, uh, second, and the third thing is some uh, value that I want, a common uh, thing you'll see is uh, using an underscore in front of the variable name. This is an idiom in Elixir. Uh, if we define this in one of our functions that did not use first and second without using the underbar in front of it, the compiler would warn us saying, you have an unused variable, first, second, you didn't use them. But if you wanted to discard it but name it, because it makes the code more, code more clear. So if that was a better example than first or second, uh, very often you'll see a discard, but you'll name it just to make the code more clear. Yeah? If you only use the underscore in that line 37, as both the first and the second item in the list there, doesn't that force it to find the same value for the first and second? Yeah, but we don't, you, we don't ever reference the underscore. <coughs> It works, um, but you would never actually want to say, what was the value of the thing I discarded? Well, well no, but you, what you were showing up there was open square bracket, under comma, under comma, val. Could that, in close square, could that actually match one, two, three? So, yeah, so let's see, let's actually see what happens. I could eat my own words here. So if I say, that, okay, that matches, we expected, like what's the, is this gonna give me a value? No, it actually doesn't like that. It's immediately garbage collected. So I lied. Okay. Uh, I think this works though. If I discard, or if I say first here, I thought this was a discard as well, which it is, but I think I can actually reference underscore first. Yeah, I can. Uh, so that's. If you, yeah, so the compiler would warn if we, uh, in our function, had a first that we were binding, but not actually using. So you would prefix it with an underscore. Um, it, it, it is actually binding that to a, a value, um, but the compiler will stop warning you. So you can still reference it. You, if you ever find yourself referencing a prefix variable name um, with an underscore, remove the prefix because it's just odd. Because it, it mean, the intention is we're discarding this. Yeah. So the underscore prefix variable name, is that just a convention? Or is it actually treated differently It's not treated differently. It's a convention. The compiler will warn you. So it is treated a little bit differently, but we can still reference it. Um, I don't know if some of the internals optimize around it, but you could, uh, we just, we have a variable underscore first that is bound to a value. But um, the compiler would actually warn us otherwise. So the compiler treats it differently semantically. I don't think it actually optimizes it out at all. So, yeah. so you're saying that a single underscore is treated differently than a variable name that begins with an underscore? Yes, single underscore okay. literally is a discard. Okay. Variable that begins with an underscore, you can think as a discard, but if you wanted to reference that by its name, you could, but you wouldn't want to. Especially since later, maybe they would optimize that in some way. And if you had code referencing that, I'd probably consider it a little bit unsafe. And uh, here's where we get into guard clauses, which are awesome. Is anyone familiar with the term like a guard expression in Ruby? <clears throat> I use this term all the time. So like the top of my Ruby methods, often instead of like an if else or like an if case and like write your code in your method and then an end, you'll just have like a guard statement at the top. Um, I think a lot of people use this terminology in Ruby. 
So like if I, my method receives something in Ruby that I, um, if it doesn't satisfy some case, like the user doesn't have access to perform some operation, I can just say like return unless is admin user. Um, so those are like, I refer to that term guard expression in Ruby and conceptually it carries over into Elixir, but it's a little bit more powerful here and um, it's highly optimized. Uh, so in like a case statement, I can give a guard expression by using win. Uh, so here's our calculated expression again, which if we try to divide two numbers in the prior implementation, it would blow up with a divide by zero error. So I can, div I can define a uh, case statement who also has a guard. And I can say, okay, I have a division operator, number one, number two, when num two is not equal to zero, then go ahead and invoke the division. Uh, so this would define a um, signature that literally if you passed a zero as number two, a uh, clause would not exist that matches that. And this is like super highly optimized and um, I use this all over the place in my Elixir code. So if we tried to call like calculate 10 divided by zero, we get a case clause error that we actually don't have a case defined matching 10 over zero. Uh, but they're a little bit restricted uh, so we can't call like our own functions here. So if I define a function that was doing some, some of my own defined functions, it would actually blow up. Uh, it's limited, but it's highly optimized. So in Ruby, we have a guard statement that calls any code anywhere. Um, the actual guard terms in Elixir are defined to a subset of operators and a subset of built-in functions, but you can't call like user land code. And I have a giant list here if you wanna look. Um, but they're pretty cool on named functions because like if I had like a, a bank system, so if I wanted to define like a credit function, so you have crediting and a balance and amount. I can say like credit balance some amount when amount is greater than zero. And this would literally, the function signature here would be error 2 but the guard statement would um, literally define the function only for when amount is greater than zero. So this seems just like an if, like return in Ruby, but you have to start thinking about this. Like this function credit has a signature that's all three uh, name arity plus guard statements that define um, the actual uh, function that the virtual machine ends up invoking. And there's a huge list of functions that you can use. Um, a lot of type checking, most type checking functions are available in guards. So I can say, like if I was having a grading system, you know, def grade, passing a letter when the letter is in A or B, they did well. Um, let's see some more practical examples. So, yeah. What does it mean that a function is not defined unless one of the arguments, which presumably you're passing in the function? It's like what it means is not defined. Like the virtual machine, when I invoke a uh, function, yeah. it's going to pattern match on the function name and arity and any guard statements. Okay. So when you're invoking a function, uh, internally the virtual machine is literally pattern matching on those things. So, so the function is there, it's just like, oh, this doesn't yeah. match the pattern. So I'm, tr I'm just okay. saying, conceptually it's defined. I'm, I'm trying to make you think of, um, in terms of pattern matching. So when I ask okay. the virtual machine to do something, it's literally going to take a module and try to pattern match on those things. And if those don't match, as far as it's concerned, that doesn't exist as far as code that it should invoke. So now we'll get into one of my favorite features of Elixir, it's the pipeline operator. Is anyone familiar with, uh, does anyone do closure here? It's uh, similar to like a threading macro in closure. I think this is actually stolen directly from closure's concept. It's the first time I've seen this and it's amazing. So a lot of times when you're writing functional code, things that I hate is, uh, you almost have to write code and read it backwards. If you're familiar with any lists. In addition to the parentheses, you end up having, if you're trying to define a series of transformations, you have to almost write it backwards. Because if we want to pipe or use the value of some uh, transformation and send it to the result of another function, we end up having to write our steps from like the center, pass that in, pass that to another function, pass that to another function, and it reads backwards from the actual transformations that you're performing. So the pipeline operator exists in Elixir to pipe a value as the first argument to a function. And so here's a, a trivial example. I have like IO puts, right, hello. I can actually pipe this instead and say, okay, I wanna pipe the string hello into IO puts. So we use the pipe greater than, and that will literally make, transform that into IO puts first argument hello. Uh, but the neat thing about this is you can have still any number of arguments and pipe this uh, value. So if I have like a, an enum map operation which takes a list and a function, I can have a, uh, a list and then I can pipe that into enum map. 
So you know map takes a list normally as a first argument and then a function as a second? Well, since it pipes that as a first, my function becomes the first argument here. I can say i times 2. And it works. And uh, to me, this is seriously my favorite. This and macros are my favorite feature of the language. So if macros didn't exist or the pipeline didn't exist, I don't know that I'd be talking today. So this is one of the things that really drew me in early on because uh, this lets you describe your programs as a series of transformations. So I'll get through probably my first real world use case here. Uh, so let's say uh, someone comes down to you and they have a list of requirements for a program. They want you to hit a third party API. So we have some like user token. We want to hit the API from a, with a user ID, get a token back, authorized user token for maybe some like OAuth API. Then we want to make a JSON request to an API with the authorized user token. And then we want to save all of those JSON results to a database. So it's like a four step operation. If we wrote this without the pipeline operator, here's a fictitious uh, message service for example. We want to like import some new messages under the requirements I just described. So we have import new messages, maybe we have some OAuth user token. We almost have to write this backwards. And then reading it, it's not like we can like use indentation and we, this isn't too bad to read, but you can't grep this in your head or grok it right away. At least I can't. So we almost have to read this backwards and like go outside in. So we can say, okay, well the first thing you're doing is like, okay, take a user token here, call find user by token. That's gonna give us back some authorized user token that we can then fetch from the API, maybe some unread messages. That's gonna give us a JSON result, which we then want it to parse to some messages in our program, and then we wanna iterate each, over each of those messages and call save message, right? So, what's that? Uck? Yeah, so that's like, yeah, I don't know. It's like, for me, that takes way too long to reason about. So that exact code, exact functionality with the pipeline operator becomes this. I can say, okay, and this is how I write almost all my code. I can say, we start with a user token, and we're gonna actually transform that into some user. And we get that result, which is an authorized user, fetch their unread messages, that's gonna give us a JSON result, parse a JSON message list, pipe that to enum each, which is a list of JSON, uh, or JSON array, and call save message. Uh, so is everyone clear on that? Like literally, this is the same, same function signatures here. Yeah, so, um, it, yeah, here you would need on everyone. And you can do, you could put this at the, you could pipe at the end of the line. It's my convention to pipe um, in this manner. Some people will pipe at the end. Uh, Elixir is so new. Yeah, Elixir is, go ahead. That's a good question. So uh, there's a lot of discussion around if like the third operation, like uh, trying to make the fetch, for example, that failed. What do we do? Uh, some people would say, well, your program should crash. And it sounds funny, but like, one way you would handle this is this operation would be supervised by a supervisor, which we'll touch on later, and you would want this to crash, and if this crashed, we would then handle it at the supervision level, which would then maybe retry, because maybe the API service was down. <coughs> so your supervisor could have logic that would say, retry this um, 10 times over a minute period. If that still fails, then the supervisor would actually crash, and then its supervisor would figure out what to do. Um, so that's one way. But a lot of cases you're not, in a lot of cases you're not going to want to supervise everything. So uh, there's a lot of discussion around um, in Elixir how we can best handle this. So Elixir recently exposed a way to easily write macros around this, um, which is, we're gonna do a little bit this afternoon, not this specific use case, but there are some mechanisms in the language you could define a macro to handle this error case um, easily. And um, there's a lot of discussion on the Elixir mailing list about how can we actually uh, do this in the language itself. So some people are suggesting like a, you would pipe into like if okay and then some other mechanisms, um, that's a good question. Um, so hop on the uh, Elixir, Lang, uh, Elixir Lang talk and Elixir Lang core Google uh, mailing list and there's a ton of active discussion um, and there's some differing opinions. So uh, it's nice that Elixir is uh, so young, we mentioned like conventions of the pipe operator, where to place them. Uh, it's so young that you can get in early and define some of your own conventions. Um, we all use two-space indentation, hopefully. Uh, so some things are set in place, but um, it's still up for opinion. Uh, so it's kind of a fun time to, to be involved. Um, but piping is literally one of my favorite features of the language. And um, I'll show you a tiny bit of real-world example. 
just to say, uh, so I'm working on a web framework in Elixir, and uh, I'll just hop into like a random uh, module that I have. And we'll see how many times I use the pipe operator. So I'm not gonna explain this code, but we can see like right away, I'm piping. So your programs become a series of data transformations, and the pipe operator literally exposes that. So it like, seems like such a simple thing, like if this didn't exist, um, it's the same code, but it, it changes the way I think about programming for some reason, I don't know why. So it's almost like, I, you know, I start in my programs, I start with some string path, I ensure that it has no leading slash, and then I split it, like it, it literally, just the fact that the pipe <coughs> exists and flattens my transformation layer out, I start thinking about, like I'll, when I first wrote this method, I wrote path down, and I said like, okay, what, I, what do I need to do with it? Well, the first step of the transformation would be strip off a leading slash then split it. So like you start thinking about it as a series of transformations um, just by virtue of being able to flatten your steps out like that. Okay. No, so it's actually really good. So there's a pull request that was just closed by Jose for people that wanted to be able to do that. To say, I want to pipe to the second argument instead of the first, or I want to pipe to the last argument. So there was actually one discussion on the mailing list that was like, I want to be able to say like, regex dollar for like the end, like basically like um, Dave Thomas, if you're familiar with Prag Dave, he ended up finally chiming in as a voice of reason saying like we've developed a Turing complete language um, as a pipeline operator. Like people were like, it was literally, it was like, well plus dollar, like that would do something like, so most of the discussion and I'm with this, uh, I would actually prefer it just stays as a single, um, pipe like that and always pipe to the first argument. Some people like this option to pipe to the second because a lot of Erlang libraries, if you're trying to do Erlang interop, will pass. The thing that Elixir passes the first argument is almost always the subject of the function. So Elixir code lends itself to always piping things to the next thing. It's like a thing you're operating on is going to always be the first argument and it lends itself very well to piping. But Erlang doesn't, Erlang just is a mix and mash. It's kind of like the, I'm not going to pick on PHP, like a PHP standard library is kind of like Needle haystack, haystack needle, who knows. Um, so Erlang's kind of similar. There was never a convention originally. So a lot of people want to be able to do the pipe uh, greater than, greater than for a lot of Erlang interop. Because otherwise, if you wanted to pipe, you have to write your own function that wraps the Erlang function. Um, but I'm of the opinion that we need to keep things simple. Because you get carried away like with what, like what Perl did and like you get too, uh, it's all clarity over brevity thing. You focus on brevity so much that we end up with this like turn complete language in like a pipeline operator, so yeah, it's awesome. What do we have next here. All right, so I'm a huge uh, space nerd. So my our first real program, real program is a rocket launch because rockets are awesome. Uh, so if you have a text editor, uh, copy and paste this in because I'm going to show off a little bit of IEX feature. It's nice. Uh, so we can define a module. Let's just go ahead and uh, paste this into your favorite text editor. Uh, so you, if you name the file .exs, Elixir files are named uh, .ex and .exs. EXS stands for like Elixir script. Uh, so all of your code that you're gonna ship to production is almost always gonna be um, an EX file. EXs are compiled to uh, B bytecode. And EXS is um, an Elixir script that you can run and it will compile it in memory and execute it, but it won't spit out a bytecode beam file. So if you had something you wanna do scripting wise, uh, you would do EXS so then you wouldn't end up with this bytecode compiled in your directory that you don't care about. So for like simple one-off programs, uh, EXS is awesome. So like a lot of cases where you would just write like a simple Ruby script, do some like sysadmin related thing, you would make an EXS because we don't care about the compiled bytecode. We can just discard that after it runs. Uh, so we can save this as rocket EXS. And uh, if we fire up IEX in the directory that you uh, save that file, I gotta quit out and see where I'm at here. There we go, fire up IEX in that directory. And then you can, oops, if I type H and look up uh, C, 
Uh, C is a helper function that takes a list of files or a single file and it will compile and pull it into IEX. So if we say that as rocket EXS, I could say C rocket EXS and it compiled and it actually executed my program because I had a rocket start launch sequence. So I'll give people a couple seconds to get that pulled in. So if you want to play with code without having to copy and paste the source in the IEX that we've been doing all day, you see to bring it in and compile it. So then we have access to our rocket module. And we can call our start launch sequence and we get a liftoff statement. So we can actually walk through that code a little bit. Can everyone read that or we need to make that bigger? Good. So we're gonna do a little bit of recursion here, which is uh, coming from Ruby, we don't do much recursion, at least I, I didn't. Uh, so our rocket, the goal of our rocket is to count down from some, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> What's the error? Did you give it single quote or double quote around your, double quote. That's actually really good. I should have mentioned this before. So uh, single quote is a character list. So Erlang has uh, historically poor string handling support as far as like uh, Unicode support is concerned. Uh, so Erlang strings are defined with single quotes. Uh, so it kind of ends the debate, Elixir ends the debate of single quote versus double quote. What do I do? Uh, in Elixir, it's almost always double quote. But you can still use single quote for Erlang interop. So that's gonna be a uh, string of characters. So if I pipe this to uh, enum at zero, give me the first uh, element of this list, I get 115. Uh, so what this is, as a single quote, it converts the uh, single quoted string into a list of ASCII integer values. So a lot of Erlang libraries will use single quotes, uh, but Elixir almost always uses double quotes, which is a UTF-8 encoded uh, binary string. So pretty much always use double quotes when you're writing Elixir code, but if you're trying to go for Erlang interop, you'll have to call a string dot to car list, which we don't really need to get into right now, but if I wanna convert my name into a character list to get the single quote version, I have to actually convert that. And you'll get into that when you're doing Erlang interop. We can go to a car character list or from a character list, but in Elixir, we always use a double quote. And that works for you now with double quote? Yeah, it was actually a great question. I'm glad you had an issue. Yeah. Uh, what is the, so bang is used in Ruby to indicate uh, mutation. What is bang used for? I know you last month, last month you called had a bang on the end of it. Yeah, so bang in, uh, where did I? Uh, oh, okay, yeah, so bang, so bang in Ruby, we kind of use it for two ways. Uh, bang in Ruby is either mutation or it can raise an error. At least I've heard people use it. Um, Elixir, you never ever use a bang unless you potentially raise an error, is a convention. And since there is no mutation, I guess there's no other interpretation of it. So bang in Elixir is saying, I may raise an error. And uh, there's a version of two car lists without the bang that returned me a, this is called a tagged tuple. So a common convention in Elixir and Erlang is to return a tuple from a function and the first value a lot of times will literally be okay, saying like, this was okay, this worked, and then the value that I requested. And then if it didn't work, uh, I'm trying to think, I'd have to paste in an emoji. Can I do that from the terminal? Uh, command options. Oh my gosh, it worked. <laughs> okay, so if I wanna convert this to a character list. Um, okay, Yay. it shouldn't have worked. So. Elixir has actually fantastic emoji support. <laughs> and, uh, I wish, no, no, seriously, I wish I could, uh, I gave a macro talk at Erlang Factory and uh, I showed how this is done. It, at compile time, it literally takes the entire uh, known like Unicode database and compiles it to a bunch of pattern match functions. Uh, so like there's a ton of functions dealing with emojis because they're just, they're just Unicode code points. So every emoji that exists, Elixir can mutate and handle properly, whereas like Ruby, if you tried to pass an emoji to a stream, it freaks out. Uh, so there's fantastic emoji support, which is just great, right? Um, in fact, like even in Ruby, I'll give you an example. 
I use the I use this in, in my Erlang Factory talk. If I want to take uh, the string uh, Jose. Oh man, where's my uh, option, option eight? eight? Option E. Oh my gosh. Option E. Yes. Okay, so if I want to upcase Jose and Ruby, it's like ooh, doesn't quite work, right? <laughs> the E is an upcase. So I, I wonder if like Jose has such great Unicode support because his name has a Unicode <laughs> character. <laughs> I don't think so, but I use this as to pick on Ruby a little bit because like this is so trivial. We should be able to upcase strings in Ruby 2.1 properly, and that fails. Such a trivial thing. You know, we test this out in Elixir. I pipe this to string upcase. Bam! It converted that E to a capital letter. And um, this looks so trivial, but this is huge. I like, go to any mainstream language today, almost all of them fail upcasing uh, that code point. And Elixir uh, properly maps all these things and uh, it does it in a very neat way that if we have time this afternoon, I'll show you that it's taking like a flat text file and then defining like thousands of functions off of it, pattern matching on like the lowercase e and then returning an uppercase version. Uh, so our rocket module is, uh, just has a few simple functions that does some recursion. So we can see uh, we're kind of tying together some concepts. We have like a start launch sequence, which is a public function. It's the first time we're seeing def p. Uh, def p is a private function. So we wouldn't be able to invoke that private function outside this module. And uh, it's my convention to define my public and private functions by each other based on where I call them. Some people throw them, like in Ruby, a lot of people, it's like you say private and you list all your private functions. I mix and match uh, based on my needs. Uh, so we have like a start launch sequence public function and we get this uh, default 10 second argument here. So this is a single uh, arity start launch sequence, but I can call it with zero arity because I give it a default of 10. And the default uh, notation is uh, backslash backslash, <coughs> which uh, some people will frown upon saying like, what? Like, why is that? Um, and one reason is because our, our equals operator, like in Ruby, we would write it as uh, from equals 10. Um, this is a pattern match. And this is valid, but we are pattern matching on from equals 10. So if I recompile this, this is totally valid. Let's go back. Go. Oh, I'm trying to call, here we go. Get rid of that. It's going to warn you that you're redefining the module. That's normal. So if I want to call start launch sequence again, it no longer has a default argument. So it's going to blow up if I try to call it. But if I try to pass in like 20 there, it blows up because it was performing a pattern match. If I pass in 10, it works. Uh, so equals is not assignment here. It's a pattern match. Equals is always a pattern match. If it's a variable on the left-hand side, it will bind it to a value. But if you pass in from and it wasn't 10, it would perform a pattern match of the thing on the left, the thing on the right, it would blow up with a match error. Is, so, is pattern matching like that ever useful? Extremely useful. Like in, in the parameters like that? Yeah, oh yeah. Huh. So instead of writing, um, I'll try to go through some examples. Instead of writing a lot of if cases in your functions, we would define multiple, here it doesn't make sense, we could define multiple start launch sequence functions, each of them pattern matching on a value and invoking that function based on the pattern match. Instead of like, if this, do this, else do this. Yeah. Does that do that from top to bottom? Yes. Again? Okay. Yes, so. so you have like def start launch sequence zero, it would just do lift off, and then def start launch sequence from. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's actually, both your questions um, work out perfectly with a countdown example. So what our <laughs> launch sequence does, once we get rid of the, uh, whatever variable they pass in is 10, I can call a countdown. And countdown is defined twice. So if we count down and our current count is zero, we call blast off. Otherwise, it's gonna be some seconds. We don't care what it is. We print out what the current number of seconds are and then we recursively call countdown, passing in seconds minus one. Uh, so in this example, I'm not actually storing this as a value, but if I was doing something with seconds, I could say seconds equals zero here and um, that'd be totally valid. So you, use, you bind uh, variables with pattern matching and arguments um, all the time. So instead of like, you know, in Ruby code we might say like, well, if seconds is greater than zero, like a lot of like programming 101 recursion would say, okay, like what's our, the case where we need to actually spit a value back and we call blast off, um, but we don't use if statements. We could, 
Um, but the pragmatic approach is we're going to use pattern matching. As your program reads almost as like a series of specifications versus um, using explicit like if control flow. So instead of like all these branching conditions, your program literally like from top to bottom, this is a very simple example, but from top to bottom, immediately I know if I pass zero to countdown, I have totally different specification I'm blasting off. I have countdown that's uh, any number of seconds, and I evoke some other uh, behavior. Uh, so does everyone grasp at least the recursion and pattern matching in this example? Uh, pretty simple, but um, very powerful. And then we, yeah. So, how do you decide whether to put the logic into a pattern match versus a traditional How do you decide? So in my personal opinion, uh, if you can pattern match, almost always pattern match. Because the, the conditional and the function, and this I guess comes down to style, but for me, um, the virtual machine has been optimized for pattern matching for two decades. And it lives uh, is the heart of like all the code that you write. So instead of thinking about your programs as like conditional uh, branching, um, literally by defining them in pattern matching, it changes the way at least I think about code. So it comes down to style, but if this was like an if else case, for me, that would be harder to parse than reading through um, some pattern match definitions. But it, it's style. But I would say um, at least the code that I write has very few uh, if logic branching because I'm using pattern matching instead. But it comes down to personal preference. And then uh, here we have a guard statement. So if I wanted to call start logic sequence, um, I could say when from is greater than zero and when from is less than 20. And that would literally define a function that only responds to uh, those cases. So if we go back and try to, I gotta recompile. If I try to invoke this for like 24, it's gonna blow up with a function clause error. So literally, as far as the virtual machine is concerned, no function exists to invoke start launch sequence 24. And uh, that's the way I want you to start thinking about functions is like they have their own uh, signature. Yeah? Is there a way to list out for a given function name and arity in a module what patterns will match? Uh, I have to, in what example? Like well, in this case, you know, there's a, there's a condition that this definition that your cursor is on can only match when from is greater than zero and from is less than 20. Yep. So it, would there be a way to query the system and say, I want to know under what conditions there is a match for start launch sequence arity one? Oh, I see. Um, that's a good question. Let's, uh, we can say, I don't know if you can get that granular. There's some metadata defined on the module by Elixir. It's like this special underscore underscore info. Uh, but we only get arity. So okay. um, at compile time, if we wrote a macro, we, be able to, we would be able to get at that and look at what they were passing to win. But at runtime, there may be some trick, but I'm not aware of it. Okay. I just, I mean, that obviously exists in the. The virtual machine, yeah, it has <laughs> some logic to go. Yeah. But uh, that's, a beyond, that's beyond my level, but maybe there is. That's homework. If you find out, let me know. <laughs> Chris, there's a question now. Yeah. Um, I was just curious how, so countdown there to, it seems like it's a method that comes from countdown. Yeah, so, um, so you're saying like we have countdown twice here. When I call countdown here, like how does it know what is, what is it going to get called? So in this case, um, so functions are defined uh, by name and arity. They both have zero, or they both have a one arity, right? They both take a single argument. But the virtual machine's got a pattern match from top to bottom. So when I call countdown right here, if countdown was 10, it's going to say, okay, function pattern match, the name is countdown, value is 10. Okay, that didn't match. Value here is 10. Well, it's just going to bind to a variable, so it's going to invoke that definition. If I pass zero, it's going to pattern match from top to bottom and then invoke zero. This is where pattern matching comes in, where it's almost overloading, uh, but not. It's literally defining a function with a signature of name, arity, and then we can have some guard expressions. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if I defined a countdown uh, below like this, since the top one is more generic, uh, it would go forever. So we can, we can play with this. Oh, oops. Oops. <laughs> so that's one thing to keep in mind. You want to go from uh, more uh, specific to less specific. Oh, did it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're actually right. So it will warn you that, yeah. If you ever see that, you probably want to take a look for that exact case. 
Yeah, yeah. The uh, the compiler is going to warn you that uh, you have an ambiguous clause. Yeah. So I noticed that you you are just doing seconds minus one. You're not doing seconds like minus equals one. So there's no mutable state in this. Is that right? Like yeah. So Elixir so you're putting oh. countdown on the stack like ten times or something. That's actually, man, you guys are like a perfect with questions because I, I'm forgetting to mention stuff. Yeah, so if anyone's familiar with uh, tail call optimization, this is tail call optimized. So as long as a function ends in another function call, it's tail call optimized. So there is no stack overflow <coughs> cases. So um, it's going to tail call optimize that. It's not going to build up all these things on the stack. It's just going to tail call optimize it. There you go. Cool. Yep. Go ahead. Sorry, one more. Um, is the death beat countdown open paren zero, close paren, is, would that be the same as saying def be countdown of seconds when seconds equals zero? Yep. Okay. So you're saying, uh, I could say, and then, uh, oops. Like this? Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, it would be synonymous. And is it's is the same as doing seconds equals zero inside the parent? So you're saying, I could say seconds, equals zero here? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then uh, this should work. It wouldn't be entirely necessary because right. we don't need that value, but yeah, so. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, it's one of those cases where both the win, guard, and the assignment is unnecessary. We could write it more succinctly without. But yeah, totally valid. So win begins, the, you can make something more Specific, um, just by using a guard clause. So, like you were saying, like if I had uh, the function signature could look uh, nearly the same, like this, but that's still more specific because of the guard clauses, and the virtual machine's fine with that. Cool. Everyone, good on this? Any questions? Especially with the recursion. I have a question regarding guard. So in uh, yep. Erlang, it's not allowed to use a function uh, as guard. In, uh, in, uh, yeah, so we couldn't, uh, let's say, uh, what's a good rocket term here? So you're saying if we were going to have, like, uh, is about to explode. <clears throat> and, like, we're really pessimistic, so yes, always. So we're saying if we were counting down and it's zero, yeah, and you're saying if we want to say is when about to explode, oh, is, we can't do that. Um, it would not let us. So it, it should actually give you a helpful warning. Is that your question? If we try to do something like this? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're restricted to, yeah, cannot invoke function, cannot about to explode inside guard. So we'll pick that up and warn you. Um, that can't happen. Uh, so this is where you would have to either write an if statement in your function or um, oftentimes instead of ifs, I will write another function that will then pass is about to explode the value of that to countdown. So then we could say is about to explode as a first argument and then we could pattern match on that and say, oops, I could then discard it to be explicit. And then we can still get that pattern matching nicely without if else, if else, if that makes sense. Uh, but no, we're limited to, uh, I have a list on uh, the previous section. Uh, I think it's, it's exactly synonymous with Erlang. We have all those type check functions. Um, we can't use like the and and or like or or operators. It has to be the Boolean and or or. And the reason why we're limited on guards is because it's really highly optimized. Mm -hmm. So we can't do our own function definitions because then it would literally have to invoke those functions and we'd kind of lose performance. But you could write a macro if you do it. Um, so if you wanted to get really fancy, you could write a macro that literally would look like is when about to explode. And you can compile that down to like an if and do something crazy. And it would look exactly like what we saw. But um, macros are amazing, but then it's a whole like, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, okay. Went through guard clauses. Here's a, I'm not gonna type this in, but we had like that case expression on anonymous function before. Uh, it's kind of neat that anonymous functions can take multiple function heads and pattern match on each value. So this is almost like a case expression. If I had some like process input function that took like a command and then like the number of spaces that the player wanted to move, 
I could say that process input is equal to anonymous function fn, but then I can give the function multiple function heads. And it would pattern match on each of these almost exactly like you would write a case expression. And it would evoke the first one that matched. Uh, so that's kind of neat. So you could give like an enum map, pattern match on a bunch of function clauses, and uh, do something neat with that. Yes, correct. So it would be like, uh, I have that still. I have an example of this. Somewhere. I don't know if this is going to be very clear, but like I'm trying to do some transformation that I can pass to enum map here. And then I'm doing uh, some weird syntax, doing some like binary pattern matching on a map operation, it's gonna, whatever one matches, it's gonna invoke the <coughs> resulting map uh, operation. Um, so I use this in real life. I, you're not gonna use it a ton, but it's still pretty neat that it exists. Can you tell, like, line 91 and line 92, I can't yeah. tell that those aren't part of this, like, lines one and two of the same function, as opposed to being different. Yeah, I mean, some cases I would probably recommend just piping that, um, calling a function instead of giving it a fun multiple function heads. But literally, since I start fn right here at the top, I have fn and then I have end, and then anything I put in between is almost like a case block where I have a dash rocket. Thing on the left is the expression, thing on the right is the function body. Is that clear? So that's pretty cool. <coughs> and then we can get into uh, our modules can alias things, import things, and uh, there's a require keyword as well. And uh, these let you do things uh, pretty self-explanatory. So if I have like a uh, converter module and I want to alias an Erlang library, uh, so Erlang library is always referenced by like Atom. So Erlang, uh, the math library, I want to alias that as something more Elixir friendly, like capital M math. I can define a converter and say alias. I have this Erlang module math. I want to say alias that as capital M math. So then anywhere in my module, I can then reference it by capital M. And then if I want to import functions from another module, I can say, okay, import from that math library. Uh, if I leave off uh, any second argument, it's going to import all functions, all public functions. Otherwise, I can say import, okay, only give me the pi function error to zero. So you can like selectively import functions from a module. And then, all the pies, like, for all the arities. I think you have to you actually have to explicitly spell out the arity. And uh, you can do that. So one thing, uh, one reason why keyword lists exist is because they let us define uh, multiple keys of the same uh, value uh, of the same name, and that's <coughs> totally valid. Uh, so keyword lists. Um, some people are like that. Why not use like maps instead? Which maps just learn in the language, which are just like Ruby hashes, a little more performant. Um, but keyword lists are still really nice because we can store multiple keys of the same key, but then we can have different values. And it works out really handy for doing things like importing when we have a function of those named pi. Pi never takes a second argument, but if it did, we could say import pi zero, pi one. And then we can reference it like math cosine here since we aliased it and then pi we can call directly because we've imported it. So pretty simple, but you'll constantly be aliasing and importing things. Uh, one thing that trips people up initially is Elixir has no <coughs> namespaces other than what you define yourself. Uh, so I'll show you a real world example. I have uh, the framework I'm working on is called Phoenix. It's an Elixir web framework. If you examine uh, any code in here, you'll see like a ton of uh, aliases. So like I have phoenix.router.mapper. That's just my own personal namespace. Um, so I don't have any name clashes, but then I have to alias any other Phoenix router namespace because it doesn't automatically like know that it's in a Phoenix router um, namespace. Does that makes sense. So I have like uh, Phoenix router errors is another module. If I want to reference errors within my Phoenix router mapper, I have to actually alias it first. So there's no automatic uh, namespace awareness. You actually have to create aliases for that. And this looks like a ton of aliases. Normally you don't get into this many, but uh, the Phoenix router is doing like a ton of uh, metaprogramming, so it's a little bit complicated. Yeah? How does that alias work when you don't give the as clause? Yes, perfect, because I would have forgot that. Uh, so alias by default, if I leave off uh, any second argument, this is synonymous with saying uh, as path. So if you leave off a uh, second argument, it's going to automatically assume the last dot whatever is the thing you want to alias. 
Perfect question. So it's actually kind of a nice guide because it tells you these are the things I'm planning to use and it's not handy. Yeah, exactly. It's actually, um, I don't mind it, but coming from uh, Ruby, a lot of people initially are like, all this boilerplate just to use my um, own modules, but it really, in practice, isn't too bad. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this reminds me of Python's import. And okay. I'm just wondering, you know, just estimation from somebody who's more experienced with like, so how hard would it be to write a macro that takes like a namespace and then just lists off a bunch of things that you want to alias from that namespace so that you could write from Phoenix router. Oh, I want to from these yeah, from three things. Phoenix router use path resource yeah. context fill context errors mapper. Um, actually, it would be trivial and. Um, I have never considered that, but I think that would probably be a good language addition. Because what, yeah, why not? Like all these um, three things should like be able to take an array or something. So yeah, and the actual macro, if we have time this afternoon, um, I touch on macros, um, but it's a whole another topic and very <laughs> difficult. If we have time, um, I'd love to explore this because it would be a very simple macro to do that. And. Uh, just to give you an idea of Phoenix, I just want to plug it a little bit because we have a bunch of Rails folks here. This is a Phoenix router, and it might look very familiar to you coming from Rails. <laughs> I'm not trying to recreate Rails entirely, but uh, Elixir does give us a metaprogramming and macro system that lets us do like resources users do, resources comments, and we can then generate a bunch of code at compile time that does a bunch of neat stuff. Uh, so it's, it's very, very cool. That's And uh, here's, I, my next section is actually macros, but this is not an exhaustive uh, list. I debated whether or not introducing macros, because uh, it's a pretty advanced topic, um, but I want to get people a little bit, uh, give them a taste, because macros are why I'm here today, probably. Um, I love metaprogramming in Ruby. I love being able to define a router like we do in Rails, so if Elixir didn't have macros, I guarantee I wouldn't be staying here today. So I wanted to give you guys a little taste. Uh, so macros essentially are just code that writes code you've ever heard that uh, terminology. Uh, so let's pretend uh, in Elixir that the unless keyword didn't exist. They just give us if. And you say like, ah, oh, I come from Ruby, I have to have an unless keyword. And we can write that. Uh, so we can define a module. Uh, mo macros have to be defined in modules, which we can then import into any namespace. So I could define a condition module, and here I named it lest instead of like unless. I could, I could override Elixir's unless, but I could say like lest to be like, I don't know, unique. So uh, I can define a macro with def macro. And uh, the most important concept with macros is macros, uh, they look just like functions, right? Like, okay, we have a couple arguments, but macros uh, get the actual abstract syntax tree in Elixir. So instead of getting some like Boolean result as an expression, they will literally get the AST that we can then manipulate in Elixir. So I can get some condition expression that someone gave me. I can then generate my own AST with quote do some AST manipulations and convert it into an if not expression, is what we do here. And uh, let's play with that before we jump into what that's actually doing. So an Elixir quote is going to take an expression and give you the actual Elixir AST back. So I can say, what is one plus one in Elixir actually? So you're, we're looking at the Elixir AST. So when you compile your code, this is the abstract syntax tree. And the neat thing about Elixir's AST is it's in all in Elixir's own terms. So Elixir can be entirely represented, your Elixir source code can be entirely represented in Elixir's own data structures. And that makes it insanely powerful to write uh, metaprogramming because we can get any code representation and in Elixir's own data structures, we can then evaluate it at compile time, do whatever we want with it, manipulate it, generate some other code from it, and uh, it's not any like extra special syntax. Uh, so like one plus one, we can see, uh, is a three element tuple. So uh, I won't get too granular, but all of your Elixir code, everything you write, comp compiles down to a, a three element tuple in the AST. First element is the function name. And then the second argument's, argument's metadata, so we can see like the context is kernel. And the last argument is the arguments to pass to the first <laughs> argument of a plus. So if you're coming from like a list background, like this blew my mind, let's quote, uh, Elixir has a built in div keyword. I'm gonna divide four by two, get two. So if I quote that, you can quote anything and get the representation. 
if we ignore this context here, <coughs> what we end up with is like div some metadata and then 4.2, right? Um, I did a tiny bit of Lisp in college, but not much. Like this is basically what uh, Lispers write, right? If you replace the brackets with parens, this would be essentially what Lisp is doing. Uh, so for me, like that almost like blew my mind once I realized that because Elixir is essentially giving us a uh, syntax veneer over this simple AST structure, but under the hood, it's just all like a simple, uh, so like Lisper's literally code almost the AST directly. But in Elixir, we operate on top of that, but we can still dump down, jump down, get at that um, abstract syntax tree and manipulate it. Uh, so if we want to quote like an if expression, we can see if I define a macro, it's going to get the AST as if we quoted a value and then a macro's job is to take an AST and return an AST. So we immediately go into a quote because we want to return an AST back to whoever called us. And then we just write some Elixir code. Because remember, quote, all a quote does is return an AST. If I want to interpolate a value into the AST, I use unquote. And um, if you're not familiar with, like, I think like, un the term like quote and unquote comes from, uh, I think list closure does it too, right? Yeah, um, initially this might seem unusual, but uh, the best way to think about quote and unquote is like string interpolation for code. So if I have some expression um, outside this AST I'm generating, if I want to interpolate that into my quoted AST, I have to use unquote. So it's almost like if I had a variable in a string and I wanted to inject the value of that variable into the string, um, that's what unquote does for us. So I say, if not, and then I want to inject the value of AST directly in that spot, so I just say unquote expression, and then any options are just going to be the do in block. So in Elixir, um, I can say if whatever, uh, comma do in, and that, that do in is going to be our options. And we can just unquote it directly in place. Uh, so literally, that's all that's required to write our own like unless macro. So you could copy and paste this in place to play with it. So I have a condition ma macro. And the only caveat is you have to require it to ensure that its macros are uh, in the scope here. Um, in practice, I don't think I've ever written, uh, I've, I've never used the require keyword in Elixir in my own code because at compile time, everything is already um, required and anytime you import a module, it is required. So I've never explicitly required one in my own code, but if you ever are playing with these things in IEX, you need to uh, require the module before we can actually invoke its uh, lest macro. So I can say condition.lest uh, 5 equals equals 5. And I get nil. I should be able to import condition. And uh, yeah, so if I, I can import modules directly into the scope here. You can basically just add the language. Yeah, so what macros give you. Literally, just like Ruby, you can make DSLs and you can literally add things to the language. And what Jose has said, which is really neat, the best way to think about this is like programming languages over time um, fall out of favor because they become outdated. And you, you basically you start programming languages are written and then they're they get they're not mutable enough to change that um, eventually something else rises up to replace them. But Elixir basically gives us all the main building blocks to define our own keywords in the language. So if some new requirement comes up later in the future and you said like, I really wish that existed in Elixir, like if you're trying to think in Ruby, like I really wish the pipeline operator existed in a Ruby, you couldn't do it that I've seen. Um, but in Elixir, the pipeline operator itself is just a macro. It's like literally, if we, if we looked in the Elixir source code, we would have def macro left, right, do, and it would transform the left, right thing into a um, read backwards print expression. Uh, so we have access to all this power uh, directly. Can you quote it? Yeah. yeah. So you're, the only caveat is uh, we can't define the pipeline operator is special that you couldn't just define your own like, you know, star star b operator. Uh, pipeline operator specifically is supported uh, by the compiler. But if we wanted to say, you're saying we want to quote like, uh, hello, maybe pipe it into I/O puts or something. Rep this. So this is saying we just have a function pipeline. Let's try and see. 
didn't really format it very well. Can I, ins let me try to inspect that. Uh, a pro tip is like, you know in Ruby, if I, set, I can get the previous value in IRB using the under bar. In uh, the Elixir shell, I can say v uh, negative one. I can go back the number of previous commands I want. So now I have the result of that. So if I inspect that, IO inspect should pretty print almost any data structure. Here we go, yeah, perfect. So we can see we get a three element tuple back. Three element tuple is saying, here's this function. Uh, it's gonna take a list of arguments. First argument is low, which is another three element tuple. So like Elixir itself um, is composed of three element tuples, like I said, and it's basically you end up with these stacking three element tuple scenarios. Um, I don't know if we can garner too much from this, um, but the AST is pretty easy to reason about. Um, if you get really complex, it becomes uh, very difficult, but at compile time, you could write your own function to get at this. And that's what Elixir's uh, standard EX unit testing library does. There's a single assert keyword. So I can say like assert uh, five greater than five. And internally in Ruby, this would just say, if this test failed, um, let's say, if we wrote that in our Ruby test, it would say failure, got false, expected true, or got true, got false, expected true. We, we, we would get no information from that in Ruby. So we end up with things like assert equal. And uh, it's not that bad, but in Elixir, the testing framework is just a single assert. And if this, we wrote this in Elixir, we would say test failure, um, we had five, we expected five to be greater than six. It's able to actually at compile time uh, maintain that information and you just assert everything. And uh, it, ma it maintains uh, all of that structure because at compile time it's gonna convert this and say, okay, let's just quote this because it asserts a macro, it's gonna receive the ASD. If we quote that five greater than six, what do we get? We get a very simple thing that, that we can write Elixir code to say, okay, we have a three element tuple, the first element's gonna be the operator. If it's greater than, I'm gonna run a function of the uh, assertion, and if it fails, I'm going to say, print out, we expected this thing to be whatever this thing is greater than this thing, right? So if we want to have an entire talk that we write our own assert macro online, um, if you want to check it out, literally I'll take you from um, no macro knowledge to writing a little testing DSL. And um, so hopefully is that enough to see how you can go about these things. At compile time, we can get out of Elixir code in its own data structures, then write Elixir code to inspect that to generate Elixir code. And um, it's a whole, like the first rule of macros is don't write macros, you've heard that joke. <laughs> and uh, because people can get carried away with these things, like it's very, it's like with power comes great responsibility and um, you end up generating your own language on top of Elixir. Uh, for me, it's, it's awesome, but it, it does have to be used with care. Like the assert case is the perfect case. Um, doing things like a routing layer like I'm doing, I think is enough of a win. Um, I'm actually trying to advocate people say write macros responsibly, not don't write macros. I think a lot of people have heard macros are evil so much that um, they're often just overlooked. Um, but if you go home tonight, uh, definitely look into them. And for me, macros are kind of like the future. That's why I love the language, or one of the main reasons. So there's alias import require. Uh, that's pretty much modules. So we compose modules to write almost all of our Elixir code. Uh, we can import modules directly in a function scope. Uh, so here's a simple example. If I have, I'm just going to call it tests, um, def run. Within this function, I could say import math. I don't do this ever really in my code, but this is totally valid. So only within this function scope would math exist. And then I could say just return me pi times two. I don't Now if I ran test.run, I get pi times two. So import and alias and require, actually all three are available at any, uh, any scope in functions or on modules. And it turns out they're all macros. And uh, I'll keep saying this, everything in Elixir, like def module itself, def module is a macro that generates some Elixir ASD. Uh, def itself is a macro. So if I say hdef, it's just def macro def. In Elixir source code. So Elixir itself is built primarily with Elixir macros. So if you really want to get into this, read the source code, and then it will kind of blow your mind because you can write, you could have written this. If Elixir didn't have a def keyword, it'd be terrible, um, but you could actually write all of 
what it's doing. So it literally unlocks the uh, internal representation for you to write your own keywords in the language. And for me, that, that makes it really special, coming from Ruby. So there's macros. It's a whole topic. And uh, I have a talk on it if you want to watch that. Um, but I don't have the whole day to go over them. But they're awesome. <coughs> So is everyone, here's where we're gonna get into some kind of like more advanced material. Does anyone have any questions before we get into like processes and holding state and anything else? This is a really general question, but how much Erlang do you think you need to know to get by for That's a great question, because people ask this all the time. Um, if you ask on Twitter, some, a lot of people will tell you, you have to learn Erlang first. Uh, I started with Elixir, primarily, um, with Dave Thomas's Program Elixir book. It went cover to cover and just dove into it without any Erlang knowledge. And that was sufficient to get going. Um, eventually, um, you're gonna have to jump down into Erlang a tiny bit if you wanna do any interop. So eventually, I basically, while learning the intricacies of Elixir and OTP that we'll get into, OTP is like Erlang's uh, standard library for building fault tolerant uh, programs. You're gonna have to get down, read Erlang uh, documentation, and be familiar with the semantics. But they're very close to Elixir semantics. So um, I recommend people, if you want to get into Elixir, I mean, Erlang's fine, Erlang's great, um, but just dive right into Elixir. Uh, eventually, once you get past like that beginner level, you're gonna have to dive down a little bit in documentation, um, but by that time, you're exposed enough that you'll be, be good to go. So, we've talked about Elixir being uh, immutable, and uh, being immutable makes some things really difficult. Like, what if we wanted to create anything? What if we had like a class that we just wanted to keep a count of something. The bear program is going to be counting the number of requests we've had per minute. Like where do we store that state? We can't just, have, in Ruby we would just instantiate something or on the thread we would just increment a value every time something happened and that would be perfect. But in Elixir, we, everything is immutable. So like how do we actually hold state? And this is where uh, processes come in. And processes are Elixir's unit of concurrency. Open that real quick. They live at the heart of almost everything you do in Elixir. So we spawn processes, and processes have uh, mailboxes. <coughs> so literally the term mailbox is a concept in Erlang and Elixir. And uh, we can send a process a message, and that message can be selectively received. And it's received in a mailbox. So I could, have, I could be in my own <coughs> process. Someone sends me a message, it's not gonna do anything. If I want to check my mailbox, I can hop into a receive loop Say like, hey, is anything on my mailbox? If it is, I can handle it. Otherwise, yeah. Is this a system level process or not? No, it's not a system level process. Uh, it's a, it's handled entirely by their own virtual machine, and we can run like we could spin up and like a million of them. And um, so don't think of them. They're like incredibly lightweight. I forget the, I forget what, how much memory a process takes, but it's tiny. Uh, so you can, they're cheap. I've heard the best way I've heard it termed is, uh, you never think in an object oriented language like. Um, how many, ob can I, what's the maximum number of objects I can create? In object-oriented language, you never like think that. Um, same, the same thing you should think about processes. We spin up processes for everything, and they're run concurrently, and um, we never really have to be concerned about going over some maximum process limit in day-to-day. -day. So, um, so they're cheap, and we use them for almost everything, and that's how we achieve concurrency. Uh, so we can spawn a process with spawn, and uh, if we want to receive some messages, we use a receive keyword. Uh, so go ahead, and if you have IEX running, uh, let's spawn a process. So PID is a concept you'll hear of like process ID. So PID is gonna be uh, the result of spawning some process. We can give it a function. And this is just gonna spawn a process. And then within this process, we wanna be able to send it messages. So we're gonna tell this process, hey, I'm gonna send you some messages uh, receive some messages from me. So some kind of sender variable, so some other sender process is going to send this thing a message saying, uh, we'll say what, ping, we're gonna ping it. So we're gonna pattern match on a bunch of receive clauses. I'm only gonna list one here. I can say, IO puts ping. Oops, I actually wanna make this multi-line. Font's huge. So within this clause, I can say, I will put ping, 
and then I can send, send as another keyword, back to the sender PID that sent me a message. I can send it a message pong. So we're going to ping pong some messages back and forth. In that, so now we have a process that we've spawned. It's out there and it's running. The neat thing about processes is this process ID is fully qualified. So if we have reliable wireless this afternoon, uh, you could, I could pass this process ID to your laptop if we were connected on a mesh, and you'd be able to send it messages. There's no, it'd be, it would look identical to this. So that process ID is fully qualified on any, any network uh, that's in a mesh, which is kind of cool. And we'll see that this afternoon if that doesn't make sense yet. So I can ask, is the process alive? Yes, so this thing's out there, it's waiting for messages. So I'm gonna send it a message from myself. If you remember, self returns my own process PID. So self is gonna be the IEX sessions process ID. I can send a message to uh, that PID. I'm gonna send it a tuple. So here's how I like where tuples come in as like a basic data structure. I'm gonna send it a tuple saying, well, the first thing is from me. So here's a message from me. I'm gonna tell you ping. And oh my gosh, it got ping. And remember, it sent me back a message. So it got ping here, and then it sent the sender Pong, but nothing happened with Pong, right? And this is where mailboxes come in. Uh, so processes in Elixir and Erlang, um, if you want like guaranteed, uh, there, there are two ways. So if I wanted to make sure a process was sent, I have to check my own mailbox. So if you're, this kind of seems uh, like an extra step for a lot of people, but the way this works is if we have a code running out on a mesh, I specifically have to check and a message was uh, received properly by checking my own mailbox. Because that ensures that if that process died in the middle of me sending in a message, there's no way for me to know if that actually got there unless it sent me a message back, if that makes sense. So in order to check my own mailbox, I can say from our own process, receive, and then we pattern match. I'm gonna say I can receive any message. I don't care what it is, and I'm just gonna return it back to uh, the console. End. And we can see we got the message Pong. So there's a simple process uh, mailboxes. And so if these, you, so if you do send again, is it gonna output Pong as well? Yeah, so that process actually, let's see, is it still alive? No. So that process is gone. Okay. And uh, the reason that is, is receive only executes a single time. So if we wanted this process to stay alive, we would have needed to recurse on itself and do another receive loop. Otherwise, it had no work to do, so it died. But if we sent 10 messages to that process, they would all be in the mailbox waiting. So they just queue up in your mailbox. You hop into a receive loop, it executes. If you want to go back and execute the next thing, you just hop into another receive. And we'll do that next. And uh, processes can be linked. Uh, we're going to this this afternoon. But, uh, Elixir and Erlang is all about building fault tolerant applications. So instead of spawning a process, I can link the process to my process where if uh, that process dies, it's gonna kill me with it. So you could end up building up this hierarchy of processes and you wanna say if there's some failure, I want that to cascade up and kill everybody. So if I had some API service and the API was down and I was piping that to like an analytics service, if both those depended on each other, you know, having the API service die, the analytics service can't do anything, I might want that to spiral out and kill everybody and then try to restart it up by a supervisor and then like go down and restart everything. Uh, so to show you an example of that, I can say uh, process is equal to a spawn link. That takes a function. Spawn link is gonna link uh, that process to my process. And uh, you can say receive. If you receive the message, uh, boom, I'm gonna just raise boom, which will kill the process. So I have some process. And if I send it a message, uh, boom, ah, I've killed it and I've killed myself. But if you notice, uh, so like this error report is a uh, Erlang error, and um, I actually, our IEX session died, and uh, if you notice, we're still in our IEX session. Like why does it still work, right? We're still, we're good to go. It's because our IEX session is internally supervised by a supervisor. Anytime it dies, it gets restarted. Um, so. A little bit of process supervision there. Uh, so the concept of let it crash is what you hear from the Erlang community and, and the Elixir community. And uh, it goes, instead of trying to like rescue from errors, uh, we just let our processes crash and then we have any kind of uh, failure and recovery logic in a supervisor. Yeah. And also when you raise, you don't say like this particular type of exception. Is that because we don't care we're just gonna crash? 
yeah, so Ray's, uh, just like Ruby, it can also take a uh, runtime error. There's some different errors that you could pass. Uh, I can say runtime error new here. Or forget the semantics of runtime error. But yeah, you, could, you actually you can raise, you can define your own specific exceptions and then raise those and see if we can pattern match on that. And I won't get into that. There is a uh, rescue in Elixir. So I can do a try rescue block, rescue from an error, and then pattern match on the error type. So if someone raised an error that I wanted to pattern match and rescue from and do some extra work, that exists. But um, beyond the level of what we're going into. But raise with a string is just going to raise a runtime error, like Ruby. And uh, if, our mess if our mailbox is empty, it basically is going to wait forever for a message. So if I said uh, receive, do, no one's broadcasting, this thing is just going to block forever and wait, which kind of sucks sometimes. So this thing is just, until it receives a message, it's going to basically just sit there and pull its mailbox. Uh, so there's an after clause um, that you can say wait a number of seconds. So I can say, receive some message, and then uh, after three seconds, you can say, you know, timeout, giving up or something. And it's gonna wait. Yep, they gave up. Uh, so you can develop semantics around uh, receiving messages, like if I was talking to an API or another process on the mesh. So some other node out there, there might be some latency on the network. I can say, okay, go try to do this thing. So send a process that's ping, and then I can say, immediately jump into a receive loop to get a rep response back. And then I can implement some kind of logic saying, well, if it takes more than three seconds, something terrible has probably happened to that node. So I can give up, crash myself, do some cleanup, or do whatever I need. Uh, so that's what you would use after for. And um, just realize that receive is going to be blocking forever until it receives a message. Sorry, quick question yeah. on after. Is yeah. that 3,000, is that some, or that whatever, it, whatever value, you, can that be a variable, like something that you get from the yep. big file? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Definitely. And we did the boom. So that comes into, like, how do we actually hold state? Uh, so we had to touch on processes first to hold state. Uh, so let's build a counter. Let's say, as a trivial example, we want to be able to create a counter module, send in a message increment, send in a message decrement, and be able to get the current value. How do we do that in an immutable language? Uh, so let's see how well uh, live coding works here. Let's edit, create like a counter exs file. So we can create a counter module, and we can say, well, we need to start some process to hold some state. So I can create start, take some kind of initial count, maybe default it to zero. And what we're going to do immediately is spawn a process, and then we're going to say, okay, listen for some messages, but we want to pass in that initial count to our listen function. So we want to spawn a process, Close over that initial count and call listen. So our listen function has some current state of account, whatever it currently is. And what we do is we listen for messages. So I can say receive. If I receive uh, the message inc for increment, what I need to do is my state needs to change. So what do I, I say, OK, I'm going to recurse on myself, on my process with count plus one, right? Oops. Oops. And if this doesn't click, it should click uh, momentarily. I receive decrement, I want to say, okay, listen on my count minus one. And if some sender sends me the message, uh, give me your value, I want to send the sender back my count and then again, just recurse on myself with my unchanged count. And I'm, I'm done with my receive block. Anytime I receive a message, or anytime I jump into receive, I block forever until I receive a message. Anytime that message comes in, I then always recurse on myself with my current state. You're recursing, you're not recursing with 
here, uh, it would die. So one option would be outside of our receive, we could hop back into listen with some current count. So if I say listen count plus one here, it's going to call listen and immediately hop into a receive, which blocks for another message. That makes sense? So our listen always immediately hits a receive, which will block until the end of time because we have no after waiting on a message. And if we throw this into IEX, we can say we compile, that's good. So I can say I have some process that's going to be uh, counter.start, and let's start it at maybe 100. So that guy's out there, should be alive and should be listening. So if I send it a message saying, hey, increment, hey, increment again, again, again. And if I want the value from it, I have to ask, hey, here's a message from myself, uh, give me your value. Again, nothing happens, right? Because it sent me back a message, I specifically check my mailbox and say, okay, Top into a receive, that thing should be just sitting in my mailbox. I've already received it. Let's say I receive the value, and I just want to uh, return it back to the shell. You see it's 105. So now we have, uh, does anyone, everyone understand the uh, recursion that we're doing here? We're, we spawn a process, and that thing is out there currently receiving and then recursing on itself until the end of time. And that's how we hold state, because we're always calling a function that passes our state, current state in, and then does a recurse and a receive. Yeah? I'm sorry, and maybe you covered this, and I just missed it about the mailbox, but does the mailbox function as a queue, or does it filter for anything that matches one of the receive, matching clauses in the receive, and ignore anything that doesn't match? So, like, there's a term, I think I've used selective receive probably incorrectly. I think there's a way, uh, deep in Erlang, to, you can get at the current mailbox all the messages and look through them, but in this case, uh, receive is going to execute as almost like a queue. Okay. Each time you receive a message, just sort of go through from top to bottom, does anything match these clauses? Otherwise, nope, okay, go through the next thing. But there is a way we could actually iterate and inspect each value. But normally, you're gonna jump into a receive and then pattern match on whatever the top of the mailbox is. Okay. In like, first, first in, FIFO, I think. First in, FIFO? Yeah. So is everyone clear on this? This is, uh, you want, the caveat is we don't write too much code like this directly because this is where Erlang comes in and there's conventions on top of this to not have to do this. And um, I wanted to write a manual version first uh, just to give you an idea of how state is held. Um, it's all through processes. So this process could be holding something more than account, but the idea is we have these things, they're cheap, we spin them up, and they're almost their own actors out there, and then we like query them with messages. So it's all done with message passing. And then what you see typically is uh, you would write a client, like you, we call this a server. If anyone heard of gen server, I'm gonna try to tie these concepts together. We can almost call our counter like a server. We're gonna send it messages and we get messages back. So we can write a client that queries our counter server, sends it messages and we can make a nice uh, API on top of this. I think I have an example written out here. Um, find out. Yeah, so I've already done this, so you don't have to watch me type. So we can write like a counter.client module and do like a nicer API. So we wouldn't have to like jump into our own receives to check <coughs> everything every time. So I could like wrap an API around this and say, Increment, decrement, that does my message sending. So anytime you're sending a message in your Elixir code, you almost always want to abstract it because like the caller doesn't care. The caller wants to perform an action and get a value back. So I can say increment, decrement, give it a process ID and that would just send a message, do whatever it needs to do to increment or decrement. And then I can make a counter.client.val, get the current value of that PID and that's going to send that process a message and then immediately jump into a receive to get the value back. And what this lets us do is just make a nice uh, API on top of all this stuff. So if I paste all that in, I have a, just start the counter server start, and then my client can then query that server and say, hey, oops, I didn't store the PID. So I have the process of my new counter server, 
And I can say counter client uh, increment, give it that process ID. So I should end up with like, what, three? So now I can say counter client dot value. Give me the value of that process. I get three. What was that so, magic you just did there, V minus one? Yeah, so V minus one is going to give you the value returned. Um, negative one is sending you the last thing. Negative 10 would give me the thing 10 things ago. So it's just a nice way to get the last value. Could you yeah. call the integers to be correlated to starting, I guess, history one up to whatever your step is? Okay, I don't know what that means. I don't know why. <laughs> so the it's right being 20. Well, so, so okay is a common, returning the atom okay is very common in Erlang and Elixir, so it's not unusual to see okay. I don't know why a positive value, I don't know what a positive value would have represented. Well, it's probably the response to the prompt that has the number in it. Like 20, the response to 20 was three, so if you do V of 20, V sub 20, Use negative values to look up the expression values relative to the current one. <coughs> so you're saying positive is what? Well, you Just see the how the prompt value. has a number in it? 20. Right, now do V20. Well, of course. V20. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Cool. Yeah, learn something new. <laughs> Send me a pull request on, uh, seriously, on the, like, any started documentation. I don't even have V documented, so if you want to send a pull request this afternoon, that'd be awesome. So wait, minus one is the last value? Minus one would be the, yeah, the previous value. Zero would be the current thing. I don't think it would be. <coughs> uh, so that's uh, holding state, and then we would almost always abstract it. So a lot of times, once we get into OTP, you're not going to be doing this kind of stuff yourself, but you will be sending messages using the send and receive occasionally, and you would almost always want to abstract that. It's almost like you know the internal details, just like standard our you know object-oriented patterns that we write. We always the caller doesn't care what the message uh, syntax is; it just wants you to do some work. And then uh, we can register processes under a name. So if I wanted to uh, say that that counter is going to be named count, I could then register that. We should be able to do that here. So I could say process uh, register. Uh, give it a process ID, and we're going to name it counter. So now we've registered that process, and people can send uh, counter uh, messages directly. And I can ask, uh, where is that process to see if it exists? Oops, really? Oh, I have to give it the name, duh. So if I wanted to then send it a message later, I could say, hey, give me the thing named uh, counter, and it's going to return me that PID. So it's a way to store uh, messages, or to store a process. And we could do this uh, globally on a mesh again. Uh, there's a global, that's going to register the process on the current node, but if we had like 30 laptops connected all together right now, I could globally register, uh, register name a process, which we'll actually do uh, momentarily when we run the Twitter aggregator that will say anyone can register a process globally on the mesh, and then you could look up my process ID of my laptop to send messages to. Yep. Mesh would be uh, if we connected Erlang and Elixir nodes together. Uh, and then if I send that pin a message, it could be running on your computer. So a mesh is just a bunch of nodes connected, uh, which we're going to try to do right now. Um, so do we still have internet? Anyone know? It would be awesome yeah, if we yeah, did. Right. <laughs> okay, so if, we ha if you have IEX up and running, uh, CD into the uh, advan or OTP directory. Where am I at? Let's see. OTP source. Tweet aggregator. This is a uh, OTP application. OTP stands for Open Telecom Platform, which is a great name, right? So uh, OTP started from Ericsson as a telecom library, uh, but it's maintained its name. But you can think of it you can think of it as uh, Erlang standard library for conventions for writing distributed fault tolerant, highly concurrent applications. So it's a set of conventions defined around that uh, manual process. Uh, state holding that we just wrote. And uh, we went through spawn and spawn link earlier, so it's a set of conventions around it links processes, and if they die, you run them and uh, monitor them with supervisors. So it's doing all these things. It's almost like I've heard it termed the rails of concurrency, and that's the best way to think about it. So there are these processes that we can monitor, uh, we can link, we can crash. Uh, it's a set of conventions around, you know, everyone had 20 different ways to do it, so finally Erickson was like, Let's put a library together to set some sane conventions around how most people write these things. But it's called Open Telecom Platform, uh, which is, trips people up initially. 
Uh, so if you're within that directory uh, and you have internet, run uh, mixdeps.git. And for you, it will probably do more than that. But hopefully that works for everyone. Mix uh, it. Uh, the OTP source tweet aggregator. So Elixir Express OTP source tweet aggregator. Oh, have you cloned the repo? I think I may miss a step. <laughs> <laughs> I did clone the repo, and it just gives me runtime error and just an undefined function of DAX. Uh, one second. Yeah, I did mixed up. So yeah. Elixir Express, you should be able to clone that. And we're going to try to run, we're going to run a Elixir application, but run it across everyone's computer at the same time. What's that? How do you run it? Uh, the URL? Oh, I need to shut up. Yeah. Chris McCord slash Elixir underscore Express, clone that to your so local machine. Uh, clone it just in like bash. And uh, clone it as just a get repo. And if you have it cloned, CD into the uh, OTP source tweet aggregator directory. Yeah, so, so you have this clone in your, so you're, you're in that directory. Uh, Mixdeps.git should pull in the dependencies for this project. Not an IX prompt. Not an IX That's probably why I tripped over it. Sorry. That's probably why I got the error. So yeah, outside of IEX in Bash, uh, Mix is a build tool that ships with Elixir. You can almost think of it um, like uh, Bundler and Jim and Rake combined. So it runs, uh, you can do like Mix tasks, similar to Rake tasks in your project. Uh, mix is also like Bundler where I can fetch dependencies, specify dependencies, and I can say mix steps I get mm -hmm. that will fetch the dependencies and uh, mix compiles your projects. So it's like a huge build tool, and you can also say like mix new, and it would create like a project OTP hierarchy with like standard test directories. So it's almost like, like Rails new. Um, so it's a really awesome build tool that combines a lot of great <coughs> ideas into one. Uh, so does everyone at least have that cloned? And who was able to run mixed steps I get successfully? It's, well, it's running. Okay. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll, we'll let it run for a second. Uh, so what we should be able to do if it finishes, does anyone have it actually up and running? Like it's done, mixed, up, mixed steps I get is finished? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so if you go into the documentation online on the OTP directory, source tweet aggregator, there's a readme. And uh, we're going to try to, uh, we're going to see if the standard uh, Erlang port is open, and we're going to connect up our computers together and run this program on a mesh. Uh, so to give you an idea of what it does, I'll run it on my laptop first. Uh, so I wrote this, and I wrote it against a single machine, and just assumed that it should work on 30 plus, and it did. Um, so it was a case, it's my first time writing like a distributed program when I put this together. And uh, I'll run it on my machine uh, internally. Uh, so the goal of the tweet aggregator is, I have a projector that I want to send some tweets to. And all of you guys are going to actually pull Twitter for me, make the request to Twitter, and then when you get messages back for whatever keyword that you want to search Twitter for, you want to send a message to the projector node and display on the projector. And uh, I didn't want to have all of you have my uh, OAuth credentials, so I didn't want to have to distribute those. So I have another node that I'm going to call the gatekeeper that runs on my laptop that you can send a message saying, hey, give me Chris's Twitter OAuth credentials, and it will send you a message back saying here they are. So I don't actually have to distribute those to you manually on a thumb drive or copy paste. So there's three elements here. The gatekeeper, you're going to send messages to saying, hey, give me the OAuth credentials so I can make a Twitter uh, authorized search. And if I get any messages back for whatever keyword I want to search, I want to send that to the projector node that's just displaying all the results. So we're doing distributed programming. And uh, I can run that all on a single computer to show you that it does work. So I'm in my tweet aggregator directory. Um, I have some, you're not going to run this. I have an ignored env file that has my, tw my Twitter credentials that I want to source so I can make authorized requests. And I'm going to uh, check my IP first. I, for some reason, you usually can use like host names, but we haven't had good luck with it in the past. Uh, so I'll have to use uh, my actual IP address, fully qualified name. Depending on how their network's configured, um, we'll see if this works. Okay. 
So I'm going to start up a uh, IEX node that runs on my uh, mix dependencies. But I'm going to give it my fully qualified name. So I'm going to call this node uh, gatekeeper at my IP address. And uh, the cookie uh, nodes run with a cookie, which is really a password. Um, so no one can connect without on this mesh without the password, which I named foo here. Uh, the only caveat is uh, everyone needs to be good uh, citizens here. If we're, if we're connected together, you could, you could execute code on my laptop to do anything. Please don't. <laughs> I will not be very happy. Um, so don't do that. But this is going to just run a node on my laptop with the name gatekeeper. And smix is going to say, hey, run this as a mix project. So instead of running just IEX, it's almost like Rails C. Rails console brings in all your project dependencies. We're going to run this tweet aggregator project with all its dependencies in IEX. So now I'm in IEX, like you would expect, but I have access to my tweet aggregator project uh, namespace. So I'm going to start the uh, gatekeeper is a module I've defined. I'll go through the code after we get this uh, going. Uh, gatekeeper has a become leader uh, function that basically is going to globally register a process named gatekeeper on the mesh saying, hey, I'm going to start a P I'm going to create a PID, but name this on the mesh uh, gatekeeper so other people can look me up. So it returned yes. That's what Erling does when you globally register. So I should be able to say uh, global where is name gatekeeper. Ooh, what did I name it? It's somewhere on the mesh. I guarantee it. Oh, gate underscore keeper. Uh, so become leader is going to spawn a listen like we saw earlier. I wrote this without OTP, um, but we're going to say, have I globally registered gatekeeper and I get a PID back? Okay, that worked. So now on my, I'm going to create a new uh, bash tab, but this could be on any computer. This is what you're going to do if you get this working. And I'm going to start another node named aggregator. You're not going to run the aggregator. I'm going to be the only aggregator. And uh, that's going to run the project dependencies, but I'm going to name it uh, aggregator at my IP address. <coughs> so uh, who has this code, uh, all the dependencies working? Awesome. So the goal of this is you're going to run, oops, if you have the uh, read me up, you're going to run a command just like this, but instead of client one, you're going to do like first initial last name at your IP address. So your IP address has to be correct. Uh, your name could be anything, so, so we don't get clashes. Do uh, first initial last name. Uh, if config uh, should give you your IP address. If you if config, uh, you should be able to get your current Wi-Fi <coughs> IP address. And depending on how their uh, network's configured, we may have to switch the port that Erlang's operating on. I'm going to try to do the default. Um, but we had, we, had a we had this running at Panera one day over their Wi-Fi on port 80, which is kind of cool. We had to change ports, but it all worked. Um, so from my, uh, from my gatekeeper that I uh, started, I'm going to try to connect to it. So I can say node.connect, and I can give it a fully qualified name here. So from um, my, um, yeah. Could not find rebar, which is a necessary build JSX apparently. It's a problem. Uh, yeah, it's, here. Yeah, it's, it's just the network. Only some people. Some people have successfully done it though, right? It's the network. Yeah. It's the network? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, I got oh. that done. Try again? Time to fail, though. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's, 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 it's okay. Just awesome. Oh my gosh, someone already joined. Who just joined? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Distributed programming. So the cool thing is um, on all your machines, you just joined one of these nodes. What, did you join the aggregator or the gatekeeper? <coughs> okay, so do a node.list. <coughs> yeah, capital N, node.list. You should get me, which is one node. Okay, so watch this. So you've joined me, I've joined you. I get just you. And I've started this gatekeeper node, which is just hanging out by itself. Watch what happens when I say uh, node connect here. So I'm going to connect up from my aggregator, which you're connected to. Let's round this in quotes. 
Did you get a message saying that Gatekeeper joined? Yep. Yeah, so do a node listing in. So if you join a single person on the mesh, you join everyone. So by joining a single person, the mesh yep. is right. distributed out, so you're connected to everybody now, which is pretty awesome. So there's no extra fanfare of like trying to connect everyone together. You connect one person, you're connected to everyone. Uh, so now, what's that? Sorry, I, I didn't think someone was gonna connect so quickly. <laughs> no. So uh, you're, you want to start a client node here. So you're gonna run uh, <coughs> IEX, uh, this whole command here. You can copy and paste it, but do, instead of client one, do first uh, initial last name at your fully qualified IP address okay. with the cookie foo and dash s, capital S mix. Which uh, Ruby Central. That's probably. Did you just run mixed steps again? Okay. Yeah, I think that's just the Wi-Fi failing out. And then you're gonna node connect, uh, instead of aggregator 127.001, it's gonna have to be uh, <coughs> node connect aggregator at this IP address here. And we'll wait till a few people get on. This is awesome, I was worried that we wouldn't have Wi-Fi. Mixed steps, I guess, When you run uh, any of the IEX commands? Oh, huh. computers. Uh -huh. Cool. So we, uh, so I have a node monitor process that's actually just hooking into join events that's going to print out to everyone's console. Uh, so now I want someone to send my gatekeeper a message. So you should be able to say, uh, "Oops." In your shells, you should be able to say, uh, "Tweet aggregator uh, gatekeeper dot." Access token. Uh oh, we should be able to get an access token here. <coughs> Hold on, that's a problem. Oh, it's my gatekeeper online here. Sorry, give me a second. I'm confused on which tab I'm in. Uh, just try again. I, some people have um, had issues with that. Okay. For some reason, my gatekeeper is not providing its access token. I may not have sourced. Uh, I got to quit out. Source. Enemy. What's that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you need the gatekeeper access tokens first. Uh, I don't. I may not have connected improperly. No. No, we're not. We're not even hitting it yet, but we will, and we will hit a rate limit uh, pretty quickly. No, it should be. It should be fine. Um, for some reason. Uh, no one, no one has tried to become leader on that gatekeeper, right? No. Okay. <laughs> Don't do that. You may have had like a net split with the wife. I only have one person. Yeah, second time I saw that you left. What? It's probably the Wi-Fi being uh, problematic. Yeah, I should have rejoined. Let me try one more time. You should see Gatekeeper join here, hopefully. Uh, is the Gatekeeper joined? Anybody? Everyone left but me. <laughs> but you're still up and running? Can you try to uh, quit that? Reconnect. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, try to rerun. There could be, I think this Wi Fi is probably falling over, but hopefully we'll be able to get something, at least some messages going. Uh, yeah, just try to rerun node connect again on. You should be able to. <clears throat> it means I'm rejecting you for some reason. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. New plan. Put out of your session and we're going to run on port 80. It could be. We're trying to run on the default uh, aggregator port. 
Uh, it should be uh, EPMD, uh, port 80, and then uh, daemon. And this is basically going to tell the Erlang uh, to send messages over port 80 instead of its default. Are we going to run that from the shell? Run that from the shell. And it should just return you back to it's console. Double dash daemon or single dash? Single dash. Do we need to undo that? Afterwards? No, it should be fine. Um, you, if you were trying to play at home, I mean, when you restart, it would be back on default port. But it's not going to hurt anything. Uh, so now we should be running on port 80. And let's try to see what happens when we start back up all of our nodes. Uh, the connection should be identical to what you typed before. Yeah, so try to node got connect on the aggregator again. I'm going to connect to that real quick over here. False. False. Yeah. Did your IP change? <clears throat> um, let's find out. <laughs> yeah. One thirty eight sixty six eighty three. Is that is that right? Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm able to join myself, but that's because uh, it's on my own laptop. It's just working. Uh, everyone's just getting false. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try RailsConf Expo Hall. Do oh. happen. We can leave it on port 80. It should be fine. Yeah, it's going to change, though, so. But the, uh, no, couldn't connect to the expo hall. <clears throat> uh, maybe I have no internet, but I should have an IP. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, quit out. if you had those shells running, you had to, re you had to restart them after the MP EPMD command. Uh, let's see. Let's see what happens here with this IP address. So the new aggregator should be uh, this guy. Are we on Expo Hall? Expo Hall. That's the only Wi-Fi access point I even see right now. Uh, port 80. So, like, if you ran that EPMD command, it should return you to standard out, and it should just be set now. Are you running in IEX or in your shell? Yeah, sorry, I think. Sorry? Which what? Oh, uh, RailsConf Expo Hall. That sucks. So yeah, false. It was working before, so. Um, so the whole point of this is normally it just works. So if you have a reliable network, let's we'll try for a little bit longer if we can see if it, we can get it working. But the whole idea is I can globally register a process, gatekeeper or the aggregator, and then when you say send, PID, boom, or foobar, it literally will send it to anyone on the mesh. And there's no extra fanfare, there's no extra code to say, hey, call that machine over there instead of my own laptop, it's identical. So the code you write to run on one machine, you write to run on the entire mesh. Is it broadcast It's gonna broadcast to a single process ID. Um, if you wanted to do something like that, there's a built-in thing called process groups, where I could say all these processes can join a process group, and any message sent to that process group is sent to all processes, like a pub sub type thing. And that's supported in the standard, Erlang standard <coughs> library. <coughs> No, it's just for this the my pid. I mean, if you were doing like a, if you were trying to sample uh, promiscuous mode on the Ethernet, you might get it <coughs> in networking, but it will only go to a specific mailbox of a that node. Yeah, I think 
I'm going to blame the Wi-Fi. We could try, let's try Reaper Central one more time since it was working momentarily, even though we couldn't send any messages. Um, let's try Ruby Central once, and then uh, I could walk through the code. But the, the idea is normally you would just, you're, you would pull Twitter, you would ask my laptop for its credentials, then you would pull Twitter, get results, and then send the aggregator a message to display on the console over on the projector. Good question. I think it leaves me the same one. Let's find out. So it's that guy. Oh, okay. You got back quick. No. Let me start with the gatekeeper up because that's that guy is needed for everything. And uh, make sure you have to use quotes. So if you're if you're trying to connect, doing a node connect, uh, make sure you give it an atom, but use quotes on the atom. I want to make sure everyone's not accidentally forgetting that. Uh, this is a good sign, though. So when you say node connect, you give it an atom, but you give quotes after the atom. So make sure you provide that. You. I think so. Uh, so quickly, uh, someone, after I become leader, uh, so I'm trying to become leader, but it's hanging because it's your, the global process registry is synchronized across all nodes. So the Wi-Fi is really horrible, so did I become, it's still waiting. So. Normally, this is instant, but saying globally registering a process, it's actually going to lock the mesh and ensure that only one person at one time can globally register a process. And that's handled automatically. But stuff is freaking out right now. I'm going to blame the Wi-Fi. Yeah, I'm still trying to become leader. Come on. And, uh, nope. OK, am, am I leader? So can someone say, tweet aggregator, gatekeeper, access token? Yes. If that works for you, you've sent me a message, and there's my private Twitter access token. But uh, see if you can recreate this. You should get a, a random string. Yes. OK. So distributed programming. OK. So that's pretty cool, right? You sent my laptop a message. I'm running a node for just the gatekeeper. It sent you back the access token. Pretty cool. So now you should be able to pull the Twitter API. So say tweet aggregator. This is going to be really verbose because I'm not aliasing it. Uh, dot search dot clients dot pull and then give it an array of streams like uh, I'm going to search for Elixir and it's pulling Twitter and then my aggregator is going every 10 seconds your node is going to pull Twitter and send should send this projector a message of the results we'll see what happens uh, so let me bring that command back up. Tweet aggregator search dot client dot pull and then give it an array, a list of streams. It could be anything. So search for something that you want to search on. Like Justin Bieber is what I use a lot for testing because he constantly <laughs> had new tweets. So. so every 10 seconds it's pulling and eventually it's going to exhaust my rate limit. Uh, but we should see, this is my aggregator, right? Why am I not? Oh. My aggregator needed to become leader, so you're pulling, you're notifying me, but no one became leader of the aggregator. <laughs> so the last step, this works. We should be getting uh, messages here. Come on. So normally, this is this should be instant. I think the Wi-Fi is so weak that um, it had it had to lock everyone's machines to make sure the process registry wasn't um, overwritten by anybody. But like all this stuff is handled for you, where you can globally register stuff on the mesh, and you don't have to worry about someone else trying also to become aggregator at the same time. If you did, uh, your process would actually die. So say you were running this in some kind of production scenario. Yeah. What, what kind of steps would you, what tools would you use to try and debug what's going on here? Because I mean, it seems like, okay, well, 
some of these calls are coming back pretty slowly, but is there any way to find out why and what's going on? Yeah, so there are, are tooling that I, I don't have much experience for that, but there's like uh, Conqueror is a new tool that came out recently. Oh my gosh, we're, it's working. <laughs> Scott, somebody, Ryan, get it. Okay. Distributed programming. So, yeah, there are tools for debugging these things. I don't have experience with them. Um, but you, it opens up a new set of problems of uh, distributed programming. If there was like a net split, for example, now you have a mesh that like half of the people are connected to half the people. And it's like who's alive and who's, who's not alive. So you have to handle these unusual scenarios where normally you wouldn't have to handle them. Um, but the coolest thing for this, like I said, um, if we have time, I don't know what time it is. We, we could go through this code. And I wrote this using the OTP framework, <coughs> built into Erlang, but writing Elixir code. I wrote it on my laptop, just sitting on my couch. And I had heard that, like, OK, you can just globally distribute these things, but I hadn't actually tried it. So I wrote it against one machine. I, ra I ran new tabs to run new nodes on my own laptop. That worked. And I was like, well, from what I've read, this should just work on everyone's laptop. And now yeah. we're running however many node.lists work. Um, there is no extra, no extra code is written. How many, let's see, we pipe that into enum count. How many people do we have connected? So we have 21 people running this program on a mesh right now. And literally, it was the same code to write, write it on a single computer. Uh, so that's like the dream I sell people. We're getting some crashes here. Um, we may have hit the API rate limit. So these are the Erlang error messages, which Elixir is trying to improve. Um, and they're printed in Erlang's own terms, which is a terrible idea. So you get Erlang error messages in like a data structure instead of nicely pretty printed. Um, Are they working on that? Yeah, so Elixir um, already has a really nice uh, error message layer, but like since we're hooking into OTP here, uh, they aren't. No extra. No, we haven't yet wrapped OTP error messages, so you still get some Erlang error messages. If you you can, you can um, obtain a taste for Erlang error messages and actually get meaningful data out of them, um, but for me it was very difficult getting stuff like this uh, at first. Uh, so there is meaningful error message data there. It's just embedded in a data structure. Uh, so I don't want to knock this stuff too much. Um, yeah, so that's still working. Ish. Uh, so that's OTP. We can hop into some of the code while this runs. Um, but you're basically, your clients are just going to pull forever. Uh, if someone wants to play with this, uh, I'm going to kill the aggregator node. You should see it leave, but you should still say connected to everyone else. So aggregator's gone. Um, someone, let's say, uh, you want the end here? Yeah. Yeah, you had good con connection earlier. I think. Can you do a tweet aggregator dot aggregator dot become leader? So like tweet aggregator dot capital A aggregator dot uh, become underscore leader. And uh, you'll globally register yourself as the tweet aggregator, and you should actually start seeing everyone's messages go to your laptop instead of. Aggregator dot aggregator? Yeah, it's, we should have just, I should have had instructions yeah. to, to alias that. We could have just typed alias in, shell, in the shell, and not have to specifically do that, but. Error already started? <laughs> I quit, no way. I might have typed that password. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so you're. I was just like, okay. <laughs> so are you getting any messages? So I think some of those may be either a uh, failure to fetch API issue. Are you getting any met, any actual tweets? We may have hit the rate limit. And I don't have any other credentials to. I think uh, last time I did this, I had a couple Twitter accounts, and I just like swapped out the gatekeeper to use different credentials. Um, but you're at least getting failure messages. So the cool thing is like anyone can hop on and uh, like for this example, if you had your own Twitter API credentials, you could source those. I could kill my gatekeeper since I've maximized API rate limit. Someone could then say, hey, I'm going to become the gatekeeper. And you could lease out your credentials. And then all those clients, every time they make a request, they're just asking the gatekeeper every single request, give me your credentials. So it would just work. So it's the whole thing. Like the fault tolerance, this is a, not a great example, but for like a beginner scenario, we could, have, we could have each node say, if the gatekeeper or the aggregator for some reason becomes unavailable, automatically just become the leader. And you would globally register yourself as that. And Erlang uh, OTP would actually, uh, the Virtual machine would ensure that the mesh only allowed one person to do that. So you could have a mechanism say, "Hey, become gatekeeper if the gatekeeper fails," and like then you know fault tolerance. So as long yeah. as the gatekeeper is alive, it would work. Yeah. You have uh, the, all the nodes uh, use like their own Twitter credentials, like use uh, yeah. local. Data. You could you could have each node use their own Twitter credentials. Um, 
I didn't, I, the easiest way was for me just to be able to give those out, but I didn't want to have everyone just like type them in. So it actually worked out really well to make a node be the gatekeeper, just to kind of show off this like message passing stuff. Uh, so if we pull the gatekeeper up, um, normally you would write this as in what's called a gen server in OTP's uh, framework, but I wrote it in just a uh, by manual, uh, just manual Elixir, just to show off that like how you would do it. Uh, it's very similar to like our counter example, but uh, here's the documentation. I never went over that. I can say at module doc and then give it a string. And this is what, if I said h uh, tweet aggregator dot gatekeeper, I would get that pretty printed markdown in the console. So I can provide module documentation and markdown, get at that with the h helper. And uh, my aggregate or my gatekeeper is just like, if I say become leader, it's going to say, hey, the Erlang global mod register, on the whole mesh, register the gatekeeper name, and it's going to be this PID of a uh, listener. And then listen is very similar to what we wrote for our, our like counter, where we just basically wait for some sender to ask us for an environment variable, and we kind of protect it from you guys trying to uh, ask for like, I don't know, if I had some like secret environment variable on my laptop. It restricts it to, who asked about the constant earlier? They, are they still here? Okay, well, you missed. All right, so uh, if I say at Ian Vivar is here in my module, uh, this is called a module attribute. And uh, module attributes, it's like, don't be fooled by the at sign. It's not a uh, Ruby, like a uh, attribute accessor. It's almost like a constant. So module attributes are almost synonymous with what we do with constants in Ruby. But if I define some Ian Vivars, it's just a list of uh, atoms. I can then reference that anywhere in my code with just at Ian Vivars. So it's a way that you would use constants uh, in Elixir. And um, I basically just recurse on listen uh, forever. And then anytime anyone asks for like uh, the access token, oops, I just expose this like client. I have like the client server written in a single module. So if you ask for the access token, um, I basically call git, which is just a function that takes whatever environment variable you have. And then this is like the send receive loop that we saw earlier. So ultimately when you say, hey, gatekeeper, give me your access token. It's going to say, OK, send uh, whoever the leader is, which is going to be me in this case, the message, whatever environment variable you want. And then you immediately hop in your receive loop to receive whatever you expected back. And I don't have an after here. And this is where I probably uh, should write an after, because it will block forever. So this is where we were talking about like fault tolerance. Uh, you would do this in a different way if you were writing a real system. But for fault tolerance in this case, I could literally say, OK, well, after I try for five seconds to get uh, that value, I'm, the gatekeeper's got to be gone. So then literally I could say, become leader. So there's fault tolerance. So after five seconds of trying to get an environment variable, gatekeeper's got to be gone, and I'm going to call become leader, and then I'll become the leader. And then anyone else <coughs> that asks the gatekeeper for an access token now is asking me, what which is pretty cool. To Two nodes both try to become leader at the same time. Right? So if you saw uh, when I tried to become leader both times of the aggregator and the gatekeeper, it took forever. It blocked my IAX session for like 10 seconds. Right. Um, so it, it will lock the whole mesh, everyone's machines, and only allow a single person to re globally register that name. Okay. For well, I mean like for the fault tolerance? Yeah. If, so you have, you have 10 machines, two of them at the same time, or like one of them locks and is becoming leader, but the other one also hits the after. It just, it just won't become leader. It would try to become leader, and then uh, I think whatever error message we got before, like if I try to become the aggregator, it's going to die and say already registered. Let's see. I have a no. That's okay. So it should. Uh, if, you, if you try to register, it will crash your or it will out, okay. and it would crash your process or whatever you're in. Okay. And hopefully your supervisor would restart you. But yeah, okay, it would yeah, it would funny. ensure it would ensure that that can. Um, it would ensure consistency. If that makes sense. You'd have to rely on supervisors. Yeah. So everything, uh, like your clients right now, um, this app is pretty big, but your, all your clients are currently supervised. You saw those error messages popping up. That was your client process polar dying, but it was restarted and it kept trying. Uh, that's because we have a, uh, where is it? I go into OTP. So I have a search uh, supervisor, and a lot of this is kind of like mundane uh, Erlang OTP stuff, which is like, it's a whole, there's whole books on it which you should read if you're really getting into this. Um, but I can create a supervisor for my search uh, server, 
that's going to basically pull the Twitter API. And I can start a uh, worker with the term that they use saying, <coughs> I have this gin server, which is going to be a, th a thing that we can query for values that recursions on itself, but wrapped in like a uh, convention. And I can say, if uh, any of those workers dies, there's only a single one, I want to, uh, like one for one, there's all these different options. One for one says, if a worker dies, I just want to restart it. But let's say if I had um, a bunch of pollers going, if I had like an analytics service that hits a bunch of different APIs, if uh, one of those failed to hit Facebook and Twitter, uh, let's say if one of them failed, I want to restart all my workers for some reason. And, and that's a bad example, but you could say uh, one for one, you could say one for all, and the supervisor would say, if any of my things I'm supervising dies, just kill everybody and restart everybody. So you can have different restart strategies. So if you have like all these workers uh, depending on themselves and one dies, you're gonna say, whoa, okay, let's just kill everybody, restart them because they all have to work in unison. And um, there's like a ton of different options. There's options to say, if a worker dies, try to restart it, but wait three seconds and then try to do that like 10 times and if that fails and then kill yourself and then your supervisor would then be notified. So you supervise supervisors and then that would, that would go all the way up to the application supervisor. And if that guy died, that, that's a problem. Um, but you basically, you develop your OTP application as a hierarchy of supervision trees. And it's this really uh, unique way to think about programming. And for me, I, I see it as uh, the future of the way I'm going to write programs. It's a totally different way to think about distributed programming. Like, you know, for our, our uh, Rails apps, we, we kind of like sew out. Maybe we make some REST APIs or we can communicate over like a Redis bus or something. Um, but there's, we don't think about ever connecting multiple apps together in this manner. It's always like we have to put a wall between them because there's no convenient way to connect these things. Um, but for the OTP land, you develop uh, different projects. You can still like sew out like service-oriented architecture, but you can have those things all connected on a network together, calling uh, just native Elixir back and forth. And you still develop clients, like the, the term client and server is still a concept, but it's not the way that we would think of them as Rails developers. It's the conceptual thing of I'm going to send this server a message and I'm going to get a response back. And it's all in native Elixir code, which for me is really interesting. I see it as, as the future of the programming, in my opinion. So I think uh, Ruby could learn a lot from this, but I think we are limited by just the semantics of the language. Uh, so for me, my goal is to eventually write uh, Elixir professionally. Yeah. Um, so how, in, um, in like executing and sending messages back and forth, is it doing stuff that's super efficient? I know it's compiling the byte codes and <coughs> So I don't know the, uh, I don't know what it's using back and forth. I'm assuming it's efficient. So like this, the neat thing is that all this was written around in um, telecom infrastructure initially. So if you think like back in 1986 is when they first developed this. Um, and these, all these semantics were in place like in the 80s, which is kind of crazy. Like if you go back, like even today, any mainstream language does not have these semantics. Um, so back then, um, stuff was a lot more expensive than it is today, hardware wise, as far as doing anything uh, computationally expensive. So I'm assuming, it's uh, efficient, but I don't know the semantics of like how it's doing it. Yeah. I don't know. It seems like we're through the demo. So I was gonna, yep. uh, how would you do like a I/O or talk to a database with the Elixir? Like if you wanted to pick up a process, you know, you're working in your Rails app and you want to put something on the queue or have Elixir work on, you know, certain pieces of it integrated with your existing. Yeah. So uh, Ecto is. This may answer your question. Is anyone familiar with Link from? Uh, .NET? Okay. I've never used it. So, like, Link is a uh, database, like, access language built into .NET. And uh, Jose and a couple, uh, another uh, Eric um, core maintainer of Elixir put together Ecto, which is uh, basically using macros to write, like, a database access layer. Uh, so you end up with things like, uh, I can say, I can create, like, a queryable. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I can define, like, fields that my database maps to. I have a city field, it's gonna be an integer, or a temple is an integer, and I can query in this like uh, DSL. So I can say like, uh, from W and weather, uh, where the precipitation is greater than zero, or, so I write in uh, Elixir code a query, and this is a macro that's going to actually uh, perform a query for me. So it's almost like synonymous with like a link type scenario, but literally this is just Elixir code. And it's using a macro, that from is a macro, to take in the AST of W and weather, where, select W, and um, convert that into a SQL query. Uh, so this is one option. 
um, that you would, could hook into a database access layer. Uh, internally, they're running a connection pool. You may have been asking more granular, maybe. Uh, I mean, that's fine. I mean, I don't know where they, you know, how you set it up. I mean, this is this one almost feels like a, an abstraction, like um, Active Record, but okay. So I can show you off. I I'll show this off a little bit. So I I wanted to show Ecto first because I see it as the future. Um, but I put together Atlas, which may look familiar to you. It's a database access layer, possibly inspired by Active Record, possibly. Uh, so I can say uh, def module user. Now use is something we didn't go into. It's a way to um, invoke a macro on Atlas model that does some code generation. And then I get these uh, macros like field. Uh, so that I wrote this as my first like foray into metaprogramming. So I can say like field, ID, integer, email string, and then some familiar validations. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've shipped this, this works, but um, I'm not running it in production. And I've started a web framework called Phoenix that um, I want to replace my Rails development with long term. Uh, that's my main focus. But I would love contributors on this. Um, but you can do crazy things like, you know, I can say validates format of email. I can give it a regular expression, just like we would expect in Rails. And um, I can create scopes. So the way you would call this with a pipeline operator <coughs> is uh, like this. So I can say, you know, user where, email, whatever, and that would return me some kind of query um, state, right? So all of these where's, I have a where that is a single arity of a keyword list. And all the ones I'm piping into, I also define a where that takes a first argument of the current scope. So then I can create queries some very similar to Rails where instead of chaining where, I can say user where, email user example.com, pipe that into user where state is nil, not null. And then instead of querying that off user, um, I'm using the repo concept like Ecto is and saying we could have multiple repositories in our app that connect to different databases. So I can query out, um, uh, construct this query, and then I maybe have some um, user repository over here that's connected to a user database that I have uh, defined in repo, and then repo actually is going to perform the query. If that makes any sense. Uh, so this is um, my experimentation with the database access layer, but um, hopefully maybe to inspire you that um, we can still do very uh, Rails-like things in Elixir in very similar manners. It has support for similar databases. Yeah, so this is, uh, Ecto is uh, just Postgres right now. There's a pull request for MySQL, but since Elixir um, has had some bigger changes recently, there's some work to get that in place. Um, Atlas is just Postgres right now as well, um, but I'm using uh, protocols, which I forgot to cover. Uh, protocols is the polymorphic layer, um, and you can also use behaviors, which we wouldn't get into. Behaviors are almost like specifying an interface. So I've made Atlas in a way that you could define your own uh, MySQL database driver and plug it into Atlas, and you would only have to implement like 10 functions. And as long as those connected to MySQL and could perform a query, you could write a MySQL access layer. Uh, so both Ecto and Atlas, um, the goal would be to add multiple database drivers. But it's just, just Postgres right now, unless you want to get your hands really dirty. And um, so yeah, so you can do awesome stuff. Like queries would be composable. So I can say, like, uh, define a scope as like where the site is admin. And if, it, if you pass in an email to this user search, I can then rebind that scope and keep building it out. Um, so that's, that's Atlas. And then uh, I want to show off Phoenix for a second, because this is my long, long-term goal, is a uh, web framework that gives me all the productivity of Rails. I don't want to recreate Rails, because um, a lot of the concepts don't necessarily map over to a functional language. But I want, uh, so the dream is a framework that makes me as productive as I am in Rails with uh, similar conventions, but that I can run on a distributed mesh of 50 computers um, to really like conquer concurrency and be able to like sew out my app as different um, OTP applications but all still running on the same mesh together. Uh, so you can do cool stuff like uh, I can say you know, get the pages page just like you would do in Rails and it's going to generate some route helpers for me saying like as page here. Then in my controller I can say like redirect to a page path of that router, pass in a keyword list. Um, so I'm trying to uh, develop things uh, that are kind of inspired by Rails, but uh, I'm not just trying to recreate Rails. I'm trying to um, build on top, use some like, a lot of people like to hate on Rails, especially from the Erlang community when they see stuff like this, but uh, Rails got, gets a ton right, and uh, it makes me happy to program in. So I think that we've had 10 years of innovation and 10 years of people going back and forth on these conventions, so I think they should be reused. 
Uh, so I'm not trying to recreate Rails, but there's some undeniably good things, and uh, we should borrow them. Uh, so this is really young, but uh, it's progressing steadily. I have a WebSocket layer on top as well. Uh, so what started me into Elixir originally was uh, I got in, anyone heard of the Jim Sync by chance? Real-time Rails parcels? That I, so I wrote Sync uh, a year ago maybe, and uh, I was trying to do WebSockets in Ruby, and uh, eventually I was able to do it through Fay, but I tried to get it in place through just vanilla Rails and like Action Controller Live, if anyone's familiar with Action Controller Live. And there's just like, there's no concurrency store when it comes to Rails, trying to open connections and keep them open. Uh, so I heard Sync and it works really well, but it opened my eyes to like, how are other languages doing this? And then I heard of what, WhatsApp at the time running a million connections per server. And I was like, that's pretty awesome. I want to run a million connections per server on my Rails app. Uh, and that's what I got interested in to Elixir. And uh, just to show off, I have a uh, pub sub layer in Phoenix where like you have a, oops, it's on an issue thread. So like, wouldn't it be awesome on your Rails router, you could just say, we have a router and then you have your routes. I could say in Phoenix now, channel, give it a rooms channel. And then I define a channel in Phoenix to respond to some like pub sub messages. So I can handle like joining from different WebSocket connections and I can handle events. If you're familiar with like Socket.io and Node, it's very similar. I can handle event, new message, and I can broadcast to that socket all the, uh, all the listeners that same message. And then I have a JavaScript layer, which is like, this is a trivial example. I, I'm requesting feedback. This isn't immersion to master yet. It's very close. But the code we've seen live scroll down is an entire chat app. So there's a small JavaScript layer where I can say, give me a new Phoenix socket. And then I can say, hey, socket, join the channel rooms and then like a topic lobby. And that topic could be like a user ID or anything to uh, scope a uh, like pub sub broadcast to. And then I can say like channel send. So I can broadcast on that channel, new message. And I can also listen for new messages and then run some kind of callback. Uh, so this is where I'm at with Phoenix currently, and it's uh, it's super young, and it's not uh, it's not I'm not going to replace Rails immediately, and I love Rails, so I don't think it's Rails is obviated quite yet. But I think that the building real real time applications in Rails is not a fully written story yet. I think that as a community, we need to focus more on providing mechanisms to do that, and uh, I think Elixir is also a great fit for for building out. Uh, fault tolerant, like a bunch of uh, cloud buzzwords. So I think it's perfectly suited for like uh, high concurrent, high fault tolerant uh, distributed web applications. And uh, hopefully I've proved some of that today. Um, but if you want to play with anything now, I don't know how I'm doing time wise, but I'm, I'm welcome to answer any questions, anything we haven't seen. Uh, we skipped protocols, but they're in the docs. I think we went well beyond that with uh, OTP, but if anyone has any, any input or anything they'd like, like to see. So, so in your mind, Okay. Um, in lieu of like yes. Yeah. Right so my so there's a couple options, and I'd love to have collaborators. So my goal, my secret to get it in uh, on like actual client work would be to write a uh, Sidekick compatible uh, worker processor as as something that would actually be a real world use case. So we had uh, I worked on an app that was doing like social analytics, hitting a bunch of different APIs, and. Uh, we were doing it all in Ruby. Not we didn't try like a Mint machine or celluloid out. So we were running every time we wanted to make a request for Twitter to Facebook, LinkedIn. We would run a web request and we would block that worker. But it basically got incredibly expensive. Like on Heroku, we would have to run a massive amount of workers, and it would be like um, we would block other users. So if a bunch of people hit the site at the same time, we would max out our workers, and someone may have to wait a minute until their API request came through because we were blocking an entire Rails process, like 200 megs of memory just to wait on an API request. Uh, so the idea to get it in place in production, production soon, my goal is this year, would be able to write a uh, Sidekick compatible worker, because we use Sidekick and it's awesome. We probably make it work with Rescue as well, because Sidekick is Rescue compatible. But the goal is maybe we could um, do a perform async on Sidekick onto a um, queue that a, an Elixir uh, process would be watching. An Elixir process could pick that up, do some work, make the API request, it's almost like data in, data out. The Rails app can maybe provide the credentials down to the Elixir app, all the data it needed to perform API requests. It makes the API requests incredibly efficiently because we can run processes and spin up 
a million of them. You couldn't run a million API requests. But then when you were done with the data on the Elixir side, you would enqueue a job back on the Rails queue side, and it would pick it up like any other regular worker. Does that make any sense? So there, I have some ideas that some like, you know, it's, I have a ton of fun coding in Elixir, so it's not just the um, infatuation. I think there are some clear use cases that I've hit in the real world that it would be a perfect use case for to like sideline against all the awesome Rails stuff it gives us. So I think like it would be years before I would be able to replace my Rails development. Um, but I think in the meantime, there are some clear wins. Um, doing like anything WebSocket related, like that's why I have WebSocket in Phoenix so quick, like there's no view layer currently. So I hit WebSockets first before the view layer because uh, I have a project coming up that's going to be doing some like real-time updates, some like a uh, user has like a feed of activity. We wanna be able to update that in real time. So we're coding the project in Rails, but if I can get Phoenix in place, stable enough, um, we're gonna have offload that pub sub to Phoenix. So you'd create a Phoenix channel that ran alongside your Rails app, and you would write your JavaScript doing like Phoenix channel dot new, handle all the authorization on the Elixir side. Yeah, the idea of a distributed RPC is kind of turning into a distributed Yep. There's just, you know, look at it with the packet call, packet call, beta plug, beta plug, you know, nine months ago. Yeah, that's what I got into. Um, and uh, there's been, a little bit of this like, okay, this is awesome, like, how would I do this, like, a or you Rails know, developer, so. Yeah, those are my thoughts. So I, yeah, I, I work on Rails full time, so I'm thinking constantly about how to get this into production um, in a responsible way, in a way that makes sense. And I think offloading um, PubSub, anything, any like really heavily blocking I.O. would make sense. And, um, Have you started the uh, sidekick? Um, not yet. So it's like a, it's like between a uh, web framework, a active record replacement. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't quite found the time, but that's what um, that's what I'd like to do. So it's on my on my bucket list. Yeah. You talked about zero downtime downtime deployments. Yep. You talk about how that would actually work in distributed Yeah. So I don't have um, actual professional experience with that, but the way that works is you each module has a version. And that version can be, you would do a release of your uh, software and you would have a callback in the module to say uh, there was a code change. And if the version changed, you could say, what was your current state on like a gen server? So if like our, our counter example is a trivial example, but if we want to update that counter, that process is running and we have to kill that process to restart and run the new module code. So like how do we do that with our current state? So you would do a release with a new module version and then you would write a function a code change function that said, here's the current state, and maybe that counter now is gonna be a tuple of the current count plus the number of requests that have come in totally. And you could actually take the current state and transition the existing state to the new state required by the code change. And then it would restart that process with a new state with the new code. That makes sense. I don't have a ton of experience with that, and there's a, I would caution people, um, code reloading is awesome, and I sell that as like, that's why Elixir's great and Erlang's great. Um, but for a lot of real world systems, unless you truly, truly need like hot code swapping, um, a lot of times it's way better to just, um, you know, like on our Rails apps, we'll do like a, a unicorn um, deploy where we wait till the process gracefully dies and then we, there's no like Rails spin up time. It'll wait till Rails spins up completely before serving new requests. So there's no latency in pushing out code. I almost always recommend that as the first step because uh, the problem with hot code swapping is unless you have a system that truly should never fail um, you still have to write code around, what if like a no goes down, what if there's a net split? You still have failure scenarios where hot code swapping still isn't gonna save you. You still have to write code against um, stuff crashing and having to be completely restarted anyway. Someone trips over a power cord in the data center. How do we handle that? So you still have failure scenarios where um, hot code swapping um, isn't gonna save you. So if you have failure scenarios that's handling code going down, you might wanna use that for just graceful restarts versus all the complexity of hot code swapping, but it's still awesome. So if you want to look into it, it's very cool. Yep. Question, what's, what's the testing experience like? like? It seems like, I was just trying to before, like, it seems like this, that language like this eliminates the whole class of the scenarios you have to test for in Ruby, just with how you're actually doing something like that. Yeah, so like, having, having no like shared mutable state is awesome. And um, just to, there's testing tools built into Mix. So in this, in my Phoenix project, Mix test is gonna look in the test directory and run all the tests in your projects, and it's super fast. 
Um, if we open that up, let's see if I go into, so testing, it's almost very similar to uh, uh, Ruby's test unit. So I have a test macro, I can give it a description, and then I do in block of code. And then everything becomes, everything is just an assert because we're able to get at the representation of code. Um, but I guess I'm trying, so as far as like less things to test for, um, I found that like interopping libraries is incredibly easy because there's no, nothing's being mutated. It's so like someone, there's a web framework called Dynamo that uh, Jose started, uh, but it has since handed that off to someone else. Um, and someone, there's a view layer in Dynamo, the web framework. And someone was like, can we get this into Phoenix? So like, that'd be great, but like, I can't imagine we haven't looked, we haven't tried to do any interop with this framework, it's probably gonna be impossible. And there was a pull request that evening of like massive code that they just copied and pasted and it just worked. <laughs> I haven't accepted it, but, um, cause you have these cases like functional programming becomes like data in, data out. I, so I feel like, um, I've only been doing this for a year compared to object orientation, but there's less, uh, it feels like there's less dependencies because there's less to um, clobber and not be aware of. So like the debugging becomes how is my data being transformed incorrectly versus what's the state in these 100 different objects. Um, so I feel, I, I feel like things are easier to test and easier to debug, but um, I don't know if that is just because of functional programming or if Elixir provides us some kind of extra benefit. But yeah, the testing is very, uh, just asserts, which is kind of cool, and you get nice error messages. So check out Phoenix. Uh, I have a couple resources. If you, if you want to get into this, um, there's elixirlang.org has a new getting started section that just shipped like last week, two weeks ago, which is, is really good. Uh, Freenode, elixirlang IRC, uh, I live in there constantly. I always tell people I'm worried about being too active. Um, so I'm always willing to help. Uh, there's actually a lot of helpful folks in there. Jose hangs out in there and he'll answer your questions. Uh, so that's, IRC is perfect. Um, don't be afraid to ask beginner questions. Like, the language is so new that everyone's a beginner and we can all learn from each other, so hop on there. That's probably the best, single best resource is just IRC, watching the discussions, asking your own questions. Uh, GitHub.com, Phoenix Framework is where Phoenix lives. I love ideas. I'm um, trying to discover some new ideas and bring some awesome innovation from Rails uh, into Phoenix where it makes sense. So if you have any input on that, um, hop in on the issues list. I'm kind of using it as like an active discussion for their issues with like RFC, request for comment. Uh, and I'd love to have collaborators, contributors. I'm Chris McCord on Twitter, and uh, it's my email if you need to reach me. I'm always willing to help out. And uh, I'll probably be hanging around a little bit afterwards if you wanna see any other code examples. But uh, the Prague Prog book, I don't think I have that listed there. Pull that back up. Oh, is it? Yeah. I wonder if they planned that. Really, yeah, so the Prague Prog book by uh, Dave Thomas is where I started, and it's, it's excellent. Um, it, it's like a, uh, it's a condensed version, so like he wrote the uh, like pickaxe book, if anyone has a pickaxe book. Um, so it's not a, uh, it's not billed as like a complete exhaustive uh, elixir book, but it's enough to get in, get your feet wet. It introduces OTP a little bit, and we'll talk about like enough to get you started into not knowing Erling, and then I finished the book with enough knowledge to be able to find out whatever I needed. So like you'll, go, you'll come in, and if there's some Erling documentation you need to get into, you'll be, at least be able to be um, proficient in reading it, like how to do things. I think that's all I have. Thanks a lot.